This is ESPN on ABC. Welcome to ESPN College Football, presented by Head and Shoulders. And welcome to a big ACC road test for the number four team in the nation, Florida State, here in Winston-Salem on a perfect afternoon to meet Wake Forest. And it feels like it could be one of those crazy college football Saturdays. Michigan, they are idle, but the rest of the top six all in action today, all on the road. And this, of course, leads into a week where we will get the first college football playoff rankings from the committee. Will there be a shakeup? There always tends to be at this time of year as Halloween approaches. Hi again, everyone. I'm Bob Wachusen. Welcome to Winston-Salem. I'll be joined by Chris Budden and Robert Griffin III in just a moment. Perfect season so far for Florida State. Undefeated this year. They have won 13 in a row, stretching back to last year, the longest active win streak in the ACC, and a long winning streak as well by 30 points or better. They are red hot, but they also take on a Wake Forest team they have lost to the last three times. These teams have met and an emotional lift for Wake Forest in the final minute of their game against Pitt last week. Third string quarterback Santino Marucci to Keyshawn Williams on fourth down with less than 20 seconds to go. Then Cameron Height, the game winner, with seven seconds to play. That was the scene in the Wake Forest locker room. It was mayhem after the game. And why not? So the Demon Deacons will be looking to ride the crest of the wave of that emotion into their meeting with Florida State this afternoon as again they have won the last three times they have taken on the Knolls. A perfect Saturday afternoon and here indeed come the Demon Deacons. Let's head down to the field, check in with Taylor and Harry. Thanks, Bob. Harry, Taylor Swift, fresh off an album drop from Thursday, ready to give you some quarterback news for the Demon Deacons. It'll be Mitch Griffiths getting the start today after missing last week with an undisclosed injury. It is his ball game, but Santino Marucci will be available if they need him. He won the game for the Demon Deacons last week. But Harry, no matter what, Dave Clawson wanting to pair back this offense. They've been really successful the last couple of years against these Knolls. Yes, they have. And Taylor, you know, we know both these teams have bad blood. But, but for Florida State, they've got their top three receivers going to be out, or should I say three of their top four, and that's going to mean that Keon Coleman is going to be a focus of their offense, and he's going to be going up against one of the best DBs in the country and Kalen Carson from Wake Forest. That matchup is going to be a treat all day long, but you look at that, and you have to understand that Jordan Travis is also one of the best quarterbacks in the nation, and they just may have to ask him to do a little bit more in the running game like he did at the end of the game against Duke. We already saw them go up against the Blue Devils. Let's see if they can exercise that demon today against Wake Forest. Hey, Jenny, Jenny, where are you? It's Robert Potter. Back to you, Bob. Magical. I guess that makes me Dumbledore. Happy Halloween. We'll be back with the kickoff after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Welcome back to Wake Forest. You're watching the ACC on ESPN. Wake Forest won the toss, deferred their option to the third quarter, so they'll start the second half with the football. Newspan is back to receive the opening kick for Florida State. And he had one of the most impactful plays on special teams you'll ever see. But lets that one bounce. It's into the end zone for a touchback. His kickoff return for a touchdown last week against Duke changed the game and they've got some game changers on this offense. Trey Benson fourth in the ACC in yards per rush. Keon Coleman leads the league. It's receiving touchdowns with seven and of course Jordan Travis. He is the conductor of this orchestra. It's amazing how quickly they're able to fly back up to the booth to catch this opening possession. Well you know when you have Nimbus and you can fly from Gryffindor like I can and it happens that way but you talk about Jordan Travis he is the guy you turn the TV on to watch play and like you said he's the orchestrator of this whole thing and they'll set up Coleman on first down little wide receiver screen and he's got eight to begin 
Caleb Carson made the stop, and that is going to be a matchup we will watch all day. Number one in black and gold against number four in white and maroon. And Coleman and Carson should be a good one. Yes, they should. Nice job by Mike Novell getting Coleman the ball early. First play of the game, letting him know that he's got to be a big part today. There's a slant and a first down catch made by Coleman. Brought down by Carson, but he picks up six. Well, what do you do when your three of your top four wide receivers are out of the game? You go to the NFL guy, Keon Coleman, and get him involved early and often. In first two plays of the game, they get the ball to him, letting Wake Forest know that they're not afraid of that matchup. Play action. Seam shot. Should have been intercepted. A miscommunication there on the route, it seems, between Keon Coleman and Jordan Travis, and Kalen Carson dropped one right in his hands. Yeah, you're going to see right in his hands, Kalen Carson, normally a, a good, sure-handed guy, doesn't have any interceptions this season, but man, oh man, you got to catch the ones that they throw to you. I know he's kicking himself for that one. A rollout now for Travis. Once again, the catch made by Coleman. This time wrapped up by Carson for a modest gain. And when we spoke with Dave Clawson yesterday, he said there are times we think they may become Florida State impatient offensively and take shots. When they do, we have to take the ball away. That was a golden opportunity missed on that last play. 100%. And you talk about Keon Coleman. They just went to him for the first four plays of the game. Dave Clawson and defensive coordinator Brad Lambert, they have confidence in their corners outside. I don't think that they thought that Keon Coleman would get the first four passes of, of the football game, though. Wake Forest chose blitz on third down and seven. They'll bring five. Well protected is Travis. Now he floats back, buying time. And finds a hookup. Kyle Morlock, the tight end, has a first down as Jordan Travis was running out of time but made the play yes he was and this is part of the problem of going against him look at him he's extending the play not just to run but keeps his eyes downfield and there is not a db in the country that can cover for five six seven seconds at a time that's the beauty of jordan travis four-man rush actually a three-man rush with a spot he'll take a shot on time Kentron Portier getting an opportunity in the absence of Johnny Wilson all the way down to the 12-yard line. Yes, just a nice box fade inside go ball. He leaves enough space for Jordan Travis to drop one in there, and he makes the catch using his head to secure the ball. Oh, you got to love it. Losing the football on the mesh exchange was Jordan Travis, but he jumps back on top of it. Still takes a negative. Back close to the 17-yard line. Evan Slocum came on a nickel blitz to put some pressure on Travis. Yeah, you're going to see when they go to that mesh point, how do you stop that zone read? You attack the running back as fast as possible. Don't try to play both. Just play your responsibility. And Jordan Travis and the running back there have to have better ball security. A loss of five back to the 17. Rodney Hill back to the 13 yard line. So it will be third down and 11 as Jacob Roberts made the stop. So here's a chance against a very good red zone offense for Wake Forest to get a stop and hold to only a field goal attempt. Yeah, you talk to defensive coordinators all the time. They say we got to hold them to three in the red zone. That four point swing either way could pay dividends in this game. So if you're Jordan Travis, obviously you trust your offensive line. But once again, you're trying to get that football to the man of the hour so far. Number four, Keon Coleman. Travis has a lane. Needs a block. Gets it. Touchdown. Well, if you're Jordan Travis and Keon Coleman's not out there on the field, you can just take matters into your own hands. And we saw them 
do this against Duke, right? This is a nice little run pass option for Jordan Travis. Throw out to the left. Nobody secures the edge to the right. He just bleeds out there. You can never forget that this guy's legs are a problem. He is already off to a fast start today. More rushing yards and more rushing touchdowns than any quarterback in FSU history. And he keeps on adding to his record of touchdowns responsible for as well. The 91st of Jordan Travis's career gives FSU the lead. We are back at Wake Forest. Let's take a look at Three's Keys. Oh yeah, Three's Keys today. Number one is going to be feeling 62. Since the start of last season, Wake Forest is 10-1 and one when they limit the opposing quarterback to 62% completion percentage or lower, and 2-7 and seven when they don't. Mitch, please! The Demon Deacons need Mitch Griffiths to play the best game of his career and protect the football against the seventh-ranked pass offensive defense in the country. And new money. Kalen Carson is the best, one of the best corners in the country, and he's matched up against Keon Coleman, one of the best receivers in the country. NFL scouts are going to be locked in to this matchup all day long, and somebody's going to make themselves some money. Uh, Keon Coleman was a huge factor on the opening drive, and a big factor this year for Wake Forest, the quarterback carousel. Mitch Griffiths, he was the starter for the first six games of the season. Ineffective against Virginia Tech, replaced by Michael Kern. Kern got hurt, Griffiths came back in, he got banged up, so Santino Marucci, the third string quarterback with his first start last week against Pitt. A dramatic game-winning touchdown drive in the final seconds, but now Griffiths okay to get back on the field today. So Dave Clawson has his number one quarterback out of fall camp starting against Florida State. And they'll start with that slow mesh on the ground. Justice Ellison up the middle. And RG3, if they can run the ball today, that would be the recipe for success. Yes, it is, and it's the recipe for success because they just saw Duke do it to him last week. Duke ran for 197 yards, and they know with only eight completions that Duke put out there, they can potentially run the ball all day today, but they got to establish that line of scrimmage. And a slow push for Ellison, but good enough for a first down. You know, when you talk about them running the football, they also understand that they have to score points because on this 13-game winning streak for Florida State, they've scored over 30 points every single time. So they do need Mitch to be able to push the ball down the field and take advantage of some of those one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside that the slow mesh provides. And number 80, Jamal Banks, is going to be a big part of that for Wake Forest. Nearly popping it was Justice Ellison. Pulled down after a gain of three. So it will be second down at seven. Bernardo Green was able to make the stop. Well, this season, points per game, Florida State the best in the ACC. Wake Forest has struggled, and especially once the ACC schedule hit. Mitch Griffiths, in his first four starts, 11 touchdowns, 281 yards passing as he rolls out here and fires one right sideline. That's incomplete. Intended for Taylor Morin, but once the ACC schedule hit, the sledding got much tougher. His last three starts, Griffiths has averaged 125 yards passing and has only one touchdown pass. Yeah, and when I watch that throw right there from Mitch Griffiths, I'm saying, Taylor Morin, you got to make that play for him. When your quarterback is going through a rough patch and things aren't going the way that you thought they would, players around him have to step up and start making plays. That was a good throw. Morin's got to make that catch. Third down and seven. Griffiths, pocket collapsing, and he's got nowhere to go. Daylight disappeared for Griffiths as he has sacked Patrick Payton all over him. Helped out by Tatum Bethune. When you say, hey, who got that sack? It's like, well, the whole defensive line. They decided to have a defensive team meeting there in the backfield. If you're Mitch Griffiths, once you see it start to close in on you a little bit, you got to make a decision to get out of there, try to find an escape lane. But right now, that Florida State defensive pass rush made sure he didn't have any. Only 10 players on the field for Wake Forest. So they run a sub out late with the play clock winding down. Still have three seconds to get the snap off, and they do. Ivan Mora with a spiraling kick and a good one. Wow. All the way back to the 12-yard line, and a knee on the ground going nowhere was Coleman. So Wake Forest flips field position after a 53-yard punt, no return, down to the 11-yard line. Malik Mustafa made the stop on special teams.
ABC College Football is presented by Head & Shoulders. Make every wash count. And in part by Old Dominion Freight Line, helping the world keep promises. Can't ask for a more picture-perfect college football Saturday than what we have at Wake Forest. The student section continues to fill up for the Demon Deacons, but there is a lot of garnet and gold in the crowd here as well as the Florida State faithful has invaded here in Winston-Salem. And why not? Jordan Travis has this team looking at a possible college football playoff and national championship run, especially with the way that they dominated Duke in the second half last week. And they'll start at their own 12-yard line here. First carry for Trey Benson gets to the sideline and gets bumped out at the 17 yard line. So he picks up about five on first down. Sean Jones made the stop. Yeah, and one of those keys was hey, keeping Jordan Travis under 62% completion percentage. Well, oh, they're not off to a great start. Going five for six for 63 yards is really good for Jordan Travis. And Bob, you didn't get the memo? It's Halloween. All the Wake Forest fans are dressed up as Florida State fans. <laughs> Very convincing. Travis. Picks up a first down and carries tacklers. Tough to bring down out to the 30-yard line before finally Jacob Roberts got him on the ground to pick up a 14. We said in the open that Jordan Travis is probably going to have to use his legs a little bit more in this game with the wideouts that they have out. And right here, he's showing you his willingness to put the team on his back like that. Now, you don't want to see too many of those types of carries from your quarterback, but Jordan Travis is certainly on a mission today. Looking for Coleman. Incomplete. Tightly guarded by Kalen Carson. We've been talking about this matchup. Watch him there in the slot, running the box fade. This is the catch that Keon Coleman against most DBs, he's going to make. But Kalen Carson isn't most DBs. Calls himself the walking seatbelt. I know our sideline reporter Chris Budden has got a great story about how that came about. Get to her in a little bit. Another shot play. Broken up. Darion Williamson. Looked like he had a step. Yes. Darion Williamson beats the corner, but he didn't know that Malik Mustafa, the Nigerian missile, was out there and going to lay out to make sure that this wasn't a catch. Great defense there by their defensive leader, the guy that really gets them rolling, Malik Mustafa. Third down and 10. Four-man rush. Out of the pocket once again is Travis directing traffic. Drops one underneath. Nowhere near the first down, though. Ja'Kai Douglas made the catch, but for only a gain of three as Deshaun Jones brought him down. Yeah, Deshaun Jones got three interceptions on the season, but boy, oh boy, did he bring the wood on that hit. Ja'Kai Douglas was actually trying to block for Jordan Travis, it looked like. Jordan Travis directed him to go catch a football and ran him right into some pain. Drive kick. Taylor Morin runs under it. Makes the first man miss. But then has nowhere to go. Brought down at about the 22 yard line of Wake Forest. Let's check in with Kevin Nagandi for the first time. Bob, good afternoon. Time now for our All State Good Hands play of the day in Lawrence. Oklahoma, OU, Dylan Gabriel, oh no, Boog. Yeah, really good job by the corner sitting out playing off man with vision on the quarterback and Dylan Gabriel just late. Rock Chalk Jayhawk early. Romello dots into the house. Kansas last beat Oklahoma. Boog had hair and was in college. RG3 was seven years old, 1997. Back to you. Oof. Yeah. Wait. Who's that supposed to be for? You being seven years old or me being told you were seven years old? Yeah. In 1990, what? 1997. I think oh. they were trying to make you feel old, Bob. Not going <laughs> to lie. Mission accomplished. Kevin, thank you. I'm now balder than I was a minute ago. Come on, Claiborne. Bottled up near the line of scrimmage. Picked up a yard. 
You know, we said in the open, it always at this time of year has that feel that at some point everything explodes in college football on a given day. And there are upsets all over the place. And today, in the top six, Michigan Idol, mm -hmm. they're the only team that's off. The other five top six teams are all on the road. You never know what might happen. Yeah, you never know. And we're here in sleepy Winston-Salem. Florida State has already come out hot. They got to make sure that they try to put this Demon Deacon team away early and don't let them hang around. Because if they hang around, they got a good shot to win. Griffiths, this time well protected to the sideline on a dive incomplete for Jamal Banks. It will be third down and nine. And if you were a fan of one of these road teams today, which game would scare you the most? Oh, which game would scare me the most? I mean, you're talking about Oklahoma going up against a Kansas team that's pretty, pretty dang good. But Georgia versus Florida, yep. you know, Georgia has not looked as dominant as they, they have in past years and have a little some questions on offense. Florida's been a very streaky team. That would be something that I would look at in Gainesville. Third and nine, one on one. Wesley Grimes incomplete, the intended receiver as it went through his hands with Fentrell Cypress man to man coverage. So Florida State forces a three and out. Yeah, it just looked like. One of two things happened there. Mitch Griffiths just missed it a little bit outside, or Wesley Grimes just wasn't quite expecting that ball to be on his outside shoulder. So for Wake Forest and on this offense, they, they've got to get on the same page in the passing game. Everything has been difficult so far, but you also got to tip your hat to Florida State. Their DBs are accepting the challenge of those one-on-one -on -one matchups outside. Fair catch called for and made at the 37 yard line by Keon Coleman. Pretty good field position for Florida State when we come back and they have the 7 0 lead. All right, we've been talking about this matchup between Keon Coleman and Kalen Carson, and here's how it's looked so far today. Got slant. Tackled right away immediately. Hunt him on a little stop route. Tackled right away immediately. But now, Michaela Carson gets that opportunity to make a play and catch a pick. He drops it. But he comes back after that and has this play right here where he stops the box fade. So it's been a great matchup so far. Then chess, not checkers. We'll see which one of these guys gets the better of each other. Michaela Carson certainly wishes he had that interception back. Breaks a tackle. Stood up after a gain of eight to the 45-yard line. Let's check in with Chris. Yeah, Robert mentioned the nickname for Caleb Carson. It is the seatbelt, the walking seatbelt, which is also the name for all of his social medias. It was given to him by Jaheim Davis. He said, man, you lock up all those wide receivers like you're a seatbelt. It even has its own move. You go like this. <laughs> in fact, after the last incomplete, the teammates, even some of the security guards, doing the little seatbelt move. They'll need a lot more than that against Keon Coleman. Again, Travis on the move, and he'll throw this one away. It'll be third down and two. In case you didn't see the move. Oh, here oh. it is. Oh. Nice. Okay, Chris. Now, now, Carson says that he, he invented that and that everybody else copied him because now you'll see DBs all across the nation when they lock down a wide receiver, they do the seatbelt motion. And there's probably a little bit of debate there of who came up with it, but either way, he's a great player. Big Forrest for the blitz on third down. Incomplete on the slant left. Travis well behind. Antron Portier. Deshaun Jones in coverage. So here comes the Florida State punt group. Yeah, when you have new wide receivers out there, that angle that they're taking on some of those slants can be a little bit different than what he's used to. Jordan Travis just missed that completely behind Portier. He's got to find a way to get on the same page with him on that route. But unfortunately, they're going to be punting the football away for the similar things. And 
end over end kick. Astromano spins it back. <laughs> will it be down at the one yard line? It looks like it will. Yes, perfectly executed. Down to the one yard line, Florida State able to keep it out of the end zone and look like Jerry and Jones did it. Yes, Jerry and Jones. Oh, did everything he could to keep that ball out of the end zone. Let's see. Oh, he's in the end zone and touching the football. But the ball doesn't go into the end zone, that's so it. that's all that matters in that situation. And it's actually a different rule, college football to the NFL. In college football, the ball is the only thing that matters. And that was well done by Florida State down to the one yard line. Breathing room Ooh. as Claiborne takes a hit but gets it out to the five. He picks up four. Good God. Azaria Thomas in there laying the stick on the running back there coming out of the end zone. But yeah, just can't speak enough about how good of a play that was by Jerry and Jones. You want to talk about hustle? Mike Norvell told told us that his guys, when they go to the NFL, they're going to be ready, and they play special teams. There's a lot of guys in the NFL that have long careers just because of plays like that. Playborn again, wrapped up by Jared Verse behind the line of scrimmage. He fought his way back to the five-yard line to make it third down and six. Byron Turner eventually finished him off. Verse with penetration to get there first. And now we have Jared Verse down on one knee. So the preseason All-American who has played like it so far this season for Florida State injured on that last play. So let's check in with Kevin Nagani. Bob Penn State coming off their first loss of the season hosting Indiana. Brendan Soresby to Dakis Carter here, Boog. Really good job of evading the secondary guy and getting on top. And then it's just a bunch of missed tackles. And IU to the house. Kev, do we have a little postal house state hangover? Oh, yeah. Longest play Penn State has allowed in 20 years. Bob Wachusen was only 20 years old back then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just unnecessary. Oh, they are on <laughs> you, man. Jared first. It is good to see him walk off on his own. And hopefully he'll be able to shake off so whatever you... had him hurting. Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly what it is. Maybe he got poked in the eye or something. He's holding his face mask. Flags down. And it looks like it'll be a half the distance penalty. Offense number 17. But the penalty is enforced half the distance to the goal. It's still third down. So now this will make it closer to third down and a long eight for Wake Forest inside their own three yard line. And obviously being inside your own three is not a good thing. But when we talked to offensive coordinator Warren Giro, he said that being in those third and manageables is where they want to be. So now having that penalty puts them in a situation where they might be a little bit more conservative with this play call. Griffiths back in the end zone to the sideline broken up almost intercepted. Holy cow. Tried to fit it into Keyshawn Williams but Brady Vance was there. Yes right here Mitch Griffiths almost pulled a Dan Orlovsky running out of the back of the end zone and then he almost throws it to the other team. Brady Vance seemed like he was a little bit hungry but look at that he's so close to the back end zone line. Oh my gosh. Woo. I don't know if a rollout in the end zone with my quarterback who's been struggling a little bit to see it all is the thing that I would go to in that situation, but that's what Wake Forest did. So Ivan Mora. Minimal room towards the back of the end zone and a line drive kick, but a good one. Coleman all the way back to the Florida State 42 returnable. Gets to the 50. And to the Wake Forest 48 before he's brought down. So great field position for FSU. Time for our after question. Wake Forest has lost 44 of their last 45 top five matchups. Who was their lone top five win against? And a clue is you'll be able to make another old joke about me. <laughs> you have to go back a ways. That's a ways, huh? Was Although I, we talk about a team like Florida what, State today being on upset alert, not by a long shot. Okay. 
I don't know that your parents were alive. <laughs> 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 this one, yeah, you're, you're going to have to go deep in the archives. <laughs> He's got nine yards on first down. When we talk about teams being an upset alert today, I think it helps Florida State to have such a huge contingent of their fans here. Well, you said you wanted to put Georgia on upset alert potentially against Florida, but in Jacksonville, the dogs will have tons of fans there as Rodney Hills brought down yeah. behind the line to set up third down and about five. Yeah, and who was it? Again. It was Mike number Mustafa. three. Malik Mustafa, Woo! they call that man the Nigerian missile and you saw why just right there came downhill with a vengeance. Look at this guy. He's put, built put together nicely. Not afraid to put his body on the line and a very nice tackle for loss right there. Brad Lambert said Malik Mustafa has been the vocal leader since he arrived this year as the defensive coordinator. And he is playing like it already today. Four man rush on third down. The out on time wide open Trey Benson. And he's got a first down to the 30 yard line and then some. And two two things we just seen right right here. You're going to see Trey Benson coming out of the backfield doing something that they're not used to seeing him doing which is catching the football and being a factor in the passing game. The coaches talked about how impressive he has been in that aspect of the game. Benson. For the 28 two yards and again Mustafa in on the stop for a while with these Florida State running backs with Benson and Lawrence Toafili it was like hey when Toafili comes in we know there's gonna be some pass concepts and gadget stuff well Toafili put on 20 pounds of muscle so he could run between the tackles and Trey Benson has worked tirelessly to work on his catching ability so that he can be a factor in the passing game really impressive to see those two guys contribute in more ways and continue to develop Benson and Toafili both out there second down and eight Flanking Jordan Travis. One on one. Incomplete. Keon Coleman couldn't reach for the high throw. Let's check in with Chris. He got talking about Malik Mustafa, a guy that started his career at Richmond. Always wanted to transfer, but, but didn't know if he would get noticed because only played in four games due to COVID. Comes here and has continued to be a superstar. How hard is it to get hit by him? At one point last season, got clocked 23 miles an hour on GPS. Say what? 23. And then, and then all 207 pounds of them hits you. <laughs> Third down and eight. Three man rush. Still some pressure, forcing Travis to backpedal. And it's broken up. Jalen Garns got a left hand out and knocked it away from Jaheen Bell. Oh, these Demon Deacons are being real sticky on the back end right here. You're going to see Chalen Garns does a really nice job of not pass interfering on Jaheim Bell, but staying in his hip pocket and poking that ball out at just the right time. They knew they were going to have some matchups in the secondary that maybe seem unfavorable. But they know that when their time comes, they have to make the plays, and right there, Garns did. 46 yards away for Ryan Fitzgerald. He stays perfect. Nine for nine on field goal attempts. 30 for seven for 37 on PATs. So a perfect season so far for Ryan Fitzgerald. And it's a 10-0 Florida State lead in this season for every field goal. An extra point made by participating universities. All State will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you to All State. Bob, are you in good hands? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't get that commercial out of my head every time I see All State. Towards the end of the first quarter, 10-0, and... Wake Forest really hasn't moved the ball offensively yet. So you'd have to say from Mike Norvell's standpoint, this is the perfect recipe to settle this game down and win one on the road. But if you're Dave Clawson, what are you trying to do to inject some life into your offense as much as they've struggled this year? Yeah, if I'm on the sideline, I'm talking to my offensive line and I'm saying, guys, we're, we're struggling in the passing game just like we have for the majority of the season. We have to start running the football and get DeMond Claiborne in the open field to get Mitch Griffiths going. 
Claiborne, no chance for a return here. Back to extraordinarily young Kevin Nagano. <laughs> Bob, Oklahoma in some trouble. How about the physicality of the Kansas Jayhawks? Daniel Highshaw here, Bug. Yeah, right now one team came to play and the other one didn't. Kansas controlling this game at the line of scrimmage. Kansas right now up 14 nothing. Meanwhile, Indiana muffs a punt. Penn State takes advantage. Drew Aller wide open to Khalil Dinkins. Yeah, that's an easy touchdown. And by the way, Kev, you are not young. I, I know that. I know that. Back to our ageless wonder that is Bob Wachusen. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. First and 10 for Wake Forest at the 25 yard line. 10 nothing. The Knowles have the lead. Ellison. Pushes the pile for five yards on first down into the arms of DJ Lundy and this will take us inside of the final minute of the opening quarter. You know Bob there's nothing like two old guys calling each other old. I think it's <laughs> pretty funny. I'm getting a good kick out of it. But Spoken like someone born in the 90s. Exactly. <laughs> I am proudly 33 years old. But you talk about this Wake Forest offense. I, I, I want to see them also push the football down the field on some go routes. Allison! before he's bumped out. Fifty one yards on the scamper for Ellison. Well, Wake Forest will take that instead of a goal ball. Justice Ellison rides the way, finds the hole, and then tries to hit the burners. Now, he's not really known for being that home run hitting back, but that could be a spark of a play to get this offense feeling like they can do something against this Florida State defense. Both of these backs impressive in their own way. Ellison normally isn't that big play home run hitter. Normally that would be Demon Claiborne. He'll be in to start the second quarter, it looks like, after the long run by Ellison. But the run game, if it gets going for Wake Forest, RG3, it could keep them in this game. And it's the patience. Watch him. He finds the hole and then he bursts through it. Wow. You got to love that. If you're a Demon Deacon fan, your team is trying to get back in. Welcome back to ESPN College Football, presented by Head and Shoulders. Set for the start of the second quarter. Florida State with a 10 0 lead, but Wake Forest threatening as they are inside the red zone for the first time, courtesy of a 51 yard run by Justice Ellison to end the first quarter. Only 20 yards of total offense before that run. Here's Claiborne. And he'll lose a yard. Halen Deloach was able to make the tackle. So now second down and 11. And Wake Forest, not only have they struggled in the red zone, but Florida State's one of the only 12 teams in America to be top 12 on offense and defense in the red zone. They're the only team, in fact, to be top 12 offensively and defensively in the red zone. So this is strength against weakness, and Wake Forest is going to have to find solutions here. So you're saying they don't have much of a chance. Well, Mitch Griffiths hasn't completed a pass yet. He's 0 for 4. He's going to try here. He's going to lob one. He's got an open man. Close to the goal line, reaching it out. Morin. He'll be down inside the one-yard line. So just like that, the struggling offense completes a pass against the good red zone defense. And Mitch Griffith said, I heard you talking about me, Bob. I'm going to get it over there to Taylor Moore. Nice corner route. I wish he could have put out a little bit more in front of him so he could have walked in for a touchdown. But hey, man, Vegas can't be choosers. You're going to take what you can get at this point. Now they're sitting there on the goal line, and they've got to lean on their running game to run the ball into the end zone and make this bad boy a game. The tight end. Cameron Height to the right of Griffiths in the backfield. Playborn looking for room up the middle and not finding any. Brandon, Braden Fisk, Kalen Deloach, Lundy, they were all there. That's a loss of a yard. So here's what you were talking about, Bob, with Florida State being great, you know, top five on offense in the red zone and touchdown scoring percentage, and then on defense being in the top 12, not allowing teams to get into the end zone. So if you're sitting here at Wake, as Wake Forest, you don't really care about those stats in this moment. You're on the goal line, you have to run this ball maybe three more times in a row if that's what it takes. Ellison. Yeah. Tries to move the pile. Maybe got the yard back. 
but he'll be stopped well short of the goal line. It will be third down and goal inside the two. Again, Braden Fisk was there. Yeah, that three across look right there with three backs and Florida State's defensive line is not playing games. They are pushing this offensive line for Wake Forest back, not allowing there to be any creases. If there was a down foul for them to try to throw off of a play action or roll movement, this would be the down. Jet sweep. Touchdown. Keyshawn Williams with speed to the goal line. Just what Wade Forrest needed to get back in the game. When you can't score running the football up the middle, then sometimes you got to use a little eye candy and hand it off to that eye candy to get on the edge and catch Florida State off guard. That's exactly what Ron Ruggiero did with Keyshawn Williams. More known as a catch and run guy, so when he gets those jet sweeps, you already know he's got sweet feet. First rushing touchdown of the season for Williams, and that completes a 75-yard touchdown drive. Of course, the 51-yard run by Ellison was the key play. And we have an injury timeout as we will step aside. The playoff race is so wide open. Who's going to survive the gauntlet? College football playoff top 25, Tuesday on ESPN. Looks like good injury news for Florida State. Cheyenne Brown who was banged up at the end of the last play, able to walk off the field. A brief visit to the injury tent. You might be able to see him in the background there. He's under one of the pop-up tents now with the rest of his defensive teammates. So it seems like he's okay, but the point after attempt now for Wake Forest to try and make this a field goal game. Matthew Dennis puts it through. All right, now we have an opportunity to answer our Aflac trivia question. Aflac. All right, we're going back. We're Wake going. Forest has lost 44 of their last 45 top five matchups. Their lone win against a top five team was in 1946. Wow. Against number four, Tennessee. What were you, like five? That's, I knew that was coming. <laughs> See, sometimes you just put it on a tee and let the other oh guys spike gosh. it away. Look, it's Bob. Bob's right here. <laughs> He's, when, is he on the show? Is that you, Bob? When I had is hair. that you? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Look at that. When men were men and helmets were leather. <laughs> 12.06 to go before halftime. Looks like Deuce Spam's going to bring it out. He is dangerous. Spam, who made about as impactful a special teams play as there has been this year in college football with a big touchdown return last week against Duke, close to midfield as we check in with Kevin. Bob, how about this? Penn State secondary having a long afternoon. Brendan Soresby to Donovan McCulley. What's going on here, bud? Just poor communication. The corner blitzed and the safety didn't cover for him. They better wake up in Happy Valley. Yeah, right now it's Stun Valley. 14-7 Hoosiers with the lead after that 69-yard touchdown. Back to you guys. So Penn State may be in some trouble. We heard Oklahoma might be in some trouble. Wake Forest is back in the game against Florida State, but great field position for the Knolls at their own 43. Travis off a of play action fake, dumps one to Rodney Hill. All the way to the 35 yard line of Wake Forest before he's finally tripped up. 23 yards. Love the usage of the screen game here by Norbell. Fake it to the back roll and then get it right back to him. Rodney Hill had a touchdown last week. Does a nice job here in the open field of just taking what the defense gets him, protecting the football, and getting a big game for his offense. Now it's Trey Benson. 
A little stutter step to the sideline and a broken tackle inside the 30-yard line before he steps out. At the wake 29, he picks up five. Quincy Bryant was there to make the stop. You know, for Trey Benson, it's just really about getting him to be consistent in his production. He had 200 yards against Virginia Tech, and he followed that up with 74 against Syracuse and then 26 against Duke. They want to get him rolling early because they know as it gets colder in the season, nobody's going to want to tackle a big back like him who can hit a home run. He had a huge breakout game, 200 yards against Virginia Tech a few weeks ago. Keon Coleman, one-on-one, -on -one, breaks the tackle of Kalen Carson and finds Pater. You know, sometimes as a wide receiver, you got to make moves. But right here, you're going to see Coleman lined up against Carson, and you just got to make him miss sometimes. Put that man on his knees like it was a toilet seat right there. Gets vertical. Keon Coleman is what we call a Sunday guy. We're not talking about ice cream. He's going to be playing on Sundays here pretty soon. And on that one, he got the better of Mr. Carson. And once again, for the second time in three weeks without Johnny Wilson, where you know so much of the defensive game plan is going to be geared towards trying to stop Keon Coleman. He adds to his ACC lead in receiving touchdowns with his eighth of the year. There it is. Catch it, get vertical, use that zip arm, and then it's speed, speed, speed to the end zone. Oh Florida why? State's back up top. Me, showtime. Got their noses up, I know why. Jealous of me. Eon Coleman began his collegiate career at Michigan State, but the transfer portal, that has been a major help for Mike Norvell. He has beamed up some talent, to say the least. Found Johnny Wilson at Arizona State. He went to Oregon and brought in Trey Benson. Of course, Coleman from East Lansing to Tallahassee. Jared Burst from Albany, of all places. Jordan Travis over from Louisville, and tight end Jaheim Bell from South Carolina. All corners of the map, all of those players playing major roles for Florida State in this breakout season. 62% of starts this year have come from transfers, but he has knitted together this quilt of players from all over the country, and it's been very effective. Playborn on the run back. Now to about the 22, maybe the 23-yard line. And one of the transfers on that list, now with most consecutive games with multiple touchdowns mm. responsible for in the ACC. There's Jordan Travis up to 15 on this list. Yeah, it just shows you just how consistent he has been and why every coach that talks about him says that he is one of the best football players in the country. He knows how to get the ball into the end zone, and offensive coaches love guys who have a nose for the end zone. But I want to say a shout-out to our graphics guy who made that because <laughs> not only is it, was it awesome with the video of the alien abduction, but, uh, you know, getting those guys from all those different places that was a beautiful way to showcase that. There's the slow mesh. And a pass incomplete behind Banks. It'll be second down and 10. And that slow mesh action in the backfield, a staple of the Wake Forest offense. And now you asked Mike Norvell, what do you do with that slow mesh? And he basically said, we have to go and attack it. That's what Adam Fuller, the defensive coordinator, backed up as well. Yeah, because when you see that slow mesh, they're walking closer and closer to the line of scrimmage. So what they want to do is push the line back so the quarterback has no room to throw. And that was part of the reason that Mitch Griffiths missed that throw from behind because he didn't have a clear lane to it. A false start will now be called. False start. Offense number 54. Five-yard penalty, still second down. And again, if you're wondering what the slow mesh is, it's this approach offensively that Wake Forest takes, where the quarterback just takes a longer amount of time deciding whether he's going to pull the ball back off play action or hand it to one of his running backs. What is the biggest stress it puts on a defense? What, what action as an offense are you hoping to try and create 
in a secondary especially. Well, in every offense, you're trying to put stress on the safeties. So what the slow mesh does is if those guys come up and decide to play run, you're going to have home run shots over the top, one-on-one -on -one with the corners, which usually have outside leverage. So that's what they're trying to accomplish with the slow mesh, but they got to have a competent QB to pull it off. Nowhere to go. Patrick Payton. He went straight at Damon Claiborne and swamped him under back to the 14-yard line for a loss of three. And now it's third down and long. Yeah, you talk about, hey, how do you stop the slow mesh? How do you stop any run game? Well, it's called penetration by the defensive line. Patrick Payton did a nice job hugging the tackle there and making sure that there was no space for the running back to make any type of move before he got it. Third and 18. So now when you talk about for Wake Forest on third and 18, this is the matchup that they're going to try to go after. It's Jamal Banks there going up against Renardo Green. Griffiths looks that way and instead goes down. Omar Graham Jr. brings him down close to the line of scrimmage. Second sack for Florida State. And the Wake Forest offense went backwards. Yeah, you saw Griffiths look to Banks, didn't like the matchup. Try to get up there and go get it. But nice job by Omar Graham Jr. getting them. And when you look on the back end and you see that coverage, there is nobody open. So part of the problem is the way that the quarterback is playing, but the other part of the problem is they're not separating and giving him clear lanes to throw to. End over end kick. Fair catch on the back pedal. It's made by Keon Coleman, but again, it will be great field position for Florida State across their own 40-yard line. Kick off your Week 8 NFL Sunday. At 10 a.m. Eastern with the Countdown crew on ESPN and the ESPN app tomorrow. And Joe and Troy will have Monday Night Football in Detroit. The 5-2 and two Lions will take the field against the Raiders. They'll host a Monday Night Football game for the first time since 2018. 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. It begins on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN Deportes. And Jared Goff to Amon Ross St. Brown, one of the best quarterback to wide receiver combinations in the NFL. Yes, and don't be distracted by them getting blown out by the Ravens last week. They're a very legit contender in the NFC. Looking forward to be on Monday Night Countdown with the guys. Trey Benson. No gain on first down. Jalen Garns came up and made the stop right at the line of scrimmage. Field position has been dominated here in the first half by Florida State. Yeah, and it, you can go back to that kickoff return uh, by Deuce Spann as well. So many people talk about the offensive and defensive side of the ball, but special teams can be huge in creating those mismatches and giving you great field position throughout the game. Roll out for Travis, a flag down. He'll heave one down the sideline, jump ball, and it's pulled in for a potential touchdown. What a catch by Kentron Portier, Holding. but it comes Office back. Office number 70, 10 yard penalty. Repeat second down. Casey Roddick called for the holds that erases the portier touchdown. Man, I still kind of want to show the catch highlight because that was <laughs> fantastic there by Portier. What you're gonna see is on. You're gonna see. We always see this when the quarterback is breaking the pocket or on a design boot. If the offensive lineman, once the quarterback passes them, if they don't let go, the D lineman is taught, throw your hands up, make it look like you're being held, and refs will always throw that consistently time and time again. Really takes a spectacular play off the board for Kentron Portier and puts this Florida State offense in a little bit of a hole. So from the end zone to second down and 20. Jordan Travis, clean pocket this time. He's got room to run. He's going to direct traffic instead to the sideline. Coming back for a first down hookup is Coleman, but a flag is thrown. And they'll call Keon Coleman for a push off. Yeah, he, he definitely pushed off by it. Pass interference, offense number four, 15 yard penalty, repeat second down. Now, this is your traditional scramble drill. Keon Coleman's going to have a, a vertical route, and what they teach you as a wideout is you need to come back towards the ball when the quarterback scrambles. So here he is. They're kind of hand fighting a little bit. He sees Jordan Travis get out of the pocket, uses both hands to push off, pushed him so hard he almost fell down, and that's why they ended up throwing the flag. But nice ball there by Jordan Travis, getting it over the DB there, Mustafa. 
but I don't think Coleman needed to do that. And those scramble drills, when you stop more times than not, the DB is going to be out of control anyway. Keep your hands to yourself. Second and 35, they'll hand one off to Kaziah Holmes, and he'll lose a yard. So now it'll be third and 36. A possession that began for Florida State at their own 41-yard line, and now it will be third down back at their own 15. You just talked about field position, right, Bob? Well, those holding calls, they, they push you back, and now you're sitting here at third and 36, and I, I've always said this, there's not really a call for third and 36. You might end up just playing field possession here, um, field position game here, run the football, do a screen, but don't put yourself in a situation where Jordan Travis is now, you know, having to drop back and pass a seven-step drop in his own territory. Play clock winding down, and a timeout's going to have to be called from the sideline by Mike Norvell. We will step aside midway through the second quarter. May launching it again for Walker. Touchdown! Haynes King, might as well call him King Haynes the way he's scoring points. ACC Primetime Football, number 17, North Carolina at Georgia Tech. Tonight at 8 on ACCN. Coming up this afternoon over on ACC Network, it will be Miami hosting Virginia at 3.30 Eastern. Then the ACC Huddle Crew, a 90-minute show to wrap up the afternoon and get you set for North Carolina Georgia Tech at 8 Eastern. After the game, stay with the ACC Network for a full post-game show to wrap up the night. After the Florida State timeout, third down and 36 from their own 15-yard line. They send Bell in motion. They'll run it with Keziah Holmes. And he is going to get a chunk of yardage back, at least field position-wise, to help out the punt group. A gain of 16. Jalen Garns made the stop. But it will be Wake Forest getting the football back. Seven minutes to go before halftime. And there goes your conservative play call to play the field position game. Nice call by Mike Norvell in that situation. It's 17 to 7. You don't want to do something that's going to hurt you or put your team in a position to allow Wake Forest to continue to garner more and more confidence and momentum. Punt this ball away and pin them deep. Alex Mastromano. Short kick. Mm. Morin. Fair catch at the 35 yard line of Wake Forest. So the offense with good field position for Wake. The defense back on the field. Chris for Florida State. But Jared Burst, we saw him get poked in the eye earlier. How's he doing? Well, it's certainly uncomfortable. Uh, in between when he's on the sidelines, he's a very large ice pack on that left eye. I caught him talking to his teammates, telling him how uncomfortable it is. He would take it off. You could kind of tell that he's squinting, having trouble seeing out of it. He's out there on the field, but definitely been some uncomfortableness dealing with it. Well, he is one of the best stories in college football. An Albany transfer. He was a tight end for Albany back before COVID at 212 pounds. Mm -hmm. And Mike Norvell told us COVID hit, and he took advantage of it. He worked out every day, got up to 240 pounds, and caught their eye in a game, rushing the passer for Albany against Syracuse, entered the portal, and now he's a first-round pick, it looks like. One-on-one -on -one down the sideline, back shoulder, incomplete, flag out. Jamal Banks, the intended receiver, and Cheyenne Brown is going to get caught. Pass interference. Defense number 38. 15-yard penalty. Automatic first down. And they're going to throw this flag on Shaheem Brown because he never gets his eyes back. The receiver's trying to fight through him to come back and make the play. You can make the argument that the quarterback should have thrown a better football, and yes, that is true. But as a DB, you are taught that when that ball is in the air, you cannot touch the receiver or prevent him from coming back to the football unless you have your eyes back and are actually trying to make a play on the ball. So Mitch Griffiths takes a shot, gets paid off with a penalty call, and he's going to run it here. And drags a tackler for about three yards. What do you see in Griffiths' game that you need to see to get him on track? Because talking to Warren Ruggiero, their offensive coordinator yesterday, he said, we had other guys like John Walford and Sam Hartman that went through similar struggles here and eventually became all-conference players. Yeah, you know, I think the best way to describe it is there's a difference between being the guy and being the guy behind the guy. Mitch has been behind Sam Hartman for quite some time, and we'll finish talking about that after this play. And he'll go down. 
Jared Verse shaking off the injured eye to get the sack back to the 45 of Wake. That's a loss of eight. Jared Verse is one of the best pass rushers in the country, and you're going to see him right there at the top of your screen. Watch how he comes off and makes this bad boy sing. They try to put a tight end on him. Nope. Tackle. Nope. Mitch Griffiths, get over here. Jared Verse. Doesn't matter who you put in front of him, he's going to try to find his way to the QB, and he's very effective at it. So the best field position for Wake Forest in danger of being wasted. They may call a timeout here, and they will with one on the play clock. The Demon Deacons were a little late getting some players in. That allowed Florida State the right to substitute as well. And with the play clock winding down, Dave Clawson called timeout. So coming up next at 3.30 Eastern here on ABC, our triple header rolls on. Number seven, Texas will host BYU in Austin. And then we cap the day with Coach Prime at Colorado at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, squaring off against number 23, UCLA. Just getting the college football day started here on ABC and the most career interceptions in Florida State history. How about that list? How about the last two? <laughs> Coach Brown tied with Lee Corso. That's as good as it gets. That is as good as it gets. <laughs> That's incredible, man. But you know, you asked about Mitch Griffiths and what he needs to do. They feel like he over prepares at times and they want him to go out there and play free. I had a coach tell me once, the worst player is the guy that does everything you tell him to do or the guy that does nothing that you tell him to do. You have to find the happy medium. Quarterback run on third and 15. And again, the tackle made by Kalen Deloach at the line of scrimmage. Now, we were told yesterday that there would be some third down calls for Dave Claus and Warren Ruggiero. That would tell you we're going to go for it on fourth down, but yeah. not here on fourth and 15. No, they were trying to surprise them with a nice little quarterback draw, potentially get, you know, 10 yards, put themselves in a fourth and five position, and they certainly would go for it because they know they have to be more aggressive in those situations and use all four downs. But when you get tackled for a gain of one yard, you definitely got to punt. And then Mora will try and pin Florida State deep, aiming for the corner. And it takes a hop into the end zone. He didn't miss by much. So it'll be the 20-yard line for the Knowles when we come back. Four and a half minutes to go before halftime here in Winston-Salem. <laughs> back to throw is Jordan Travis. Sets up the screen. Trey Benson cuts it back. Breaking tackles. Trey Benson off to the races. Touchdown. Oh, oh my goodness. What a run. Way to block it up. Screen pass for a touchdown to Trey Benson covered 80 yards. Wake Forest has 81 total yards so far here in the first half. 24-7 Florida State. Oh my goodness, man. You're going to watch this guy come across. Trey Benson's going to link out, and they're going to get two offensive linemen out in front of him. And when you have big fellas that can block for the running back out in space, those short gains on screens turn into touchdowns. And watch Trey Benson cut it back across the formation and take it to the house. I mean, Trey Benson is a 220-pound monster. For him to be able to do that at that size in the passing game, right? The run after the catch. Look at this dude just built, bouncing off of dudes. He knew he was going to take it to the house. Nobody's running him down. He's getting all the way to the end zone. Through the first four games of the season, Trey Benson was struggling a bit and then got a call 
from Dalvin Cook. Ooh. And Dalvin Cook said, relax, you're going to be fine. You just keep hitting it, and it is going to break. And in the next game against Virginia Tech, he piled up 200 yards on 11 carries. And he's been a big play weapon for them ever since, as we will be back in eight seconds. Now a look from Ram Trucks. Ram Trucks, built to serve. It has been a struggle for Wake Forest offensively, but they have a chance to put some points on the board before halftime. Six possessions, five punts. They've gone three and out four times, and most of their yards came on one run by Justice Ellison. Yeah, and it's all about how they respond here, right? Football is about shifts and momentum. You got punched in the mouth, what are you going to do about it? Here's Ellison. He's got four yards on first down. Arian Jones made the stop for Florida State. You know, one of the keys for Wake Forest coming to this game when we talked to Warren Ruggiero, he said, we cannot force the explosives. Well, Bob, when you're down 24 to 7, you might want to start forcing some of those explosives. You know, running the football against a team like Florida State, who can score in bunches when you're down by 17, isn't always the way to go. they got to open up the pass again. Griff is scanning the field. Held onto the ball all day. That's a coverage sack. And the Wake Forest fans getting a little antsy as he had nowhere to go with the football and then Verse and Farmer met at the quarterback. Then yeah, you're going to see the coverage here. Well, he's got Taylor Moran open there. He's just got to wait on him for a little bit. Just seems like Mitch Griffiths was not working that side of the field. And by the time he got down to the right side of the field, he already had the pressure in his face. You know, both Dave Clawson and offensive coordinator Warren Ruggiero said that he's been too jumpy. They need him to settle down. Let's see what he can do here on this next play. Jump ball, sideline, on third down and complete. Bernardo Green was perfectly positioned in coverage. And it will be another three and out for Wake Forest. Yeah, you talk about Bernardo Green. He's Florida State's best cover guy. But the spacing right there between the routes, the slot receiver and the outside receiver seem like they were in exactly the same spot. That doesn't give the quarterback room to make the throw. And then if you're Mitch Griffiths, you have to throw your receiver out the back end right there. We talked about throwing it down the field. Let them run underneath that catch. That wasn't even a back shoulder. I don't know who he was throwing that football to. And the always dangerous Keon Coleman. In position to receive at the Florida State 35 yard line. Fair catch. Just shy of the 35. So again, good field position for the Knowles. All season long, student sections across the country are competing to be the Live Up Mosque Student Section of the Year, courtesy of Taco Bell. Download the Taco Bell app to learn more. Happy Halloween. Is that Ted Lasso? Yeah, they need Ted to create some belief. I want to see Ted Lasso in that. the locker room give him a speech. Hey, they might need that at halftime as the Wake Forest offense is really struggling. And look, last week it was an inspiring comeback courtesy of Santino Marucci at quarterback. And we were told by Dave Clawson both quarterbacks may play today. Let's see if he goes to Marucci. Swing pass out of the backfield toe of Philly. Out to the 39-yard line. It's a gain of five on first down. We always talk about these keys to the game. Well, when we talked with Mike Norvell and offensive coordinator for Florida State, Alex Atkins, they said we got to own the ball and maximize our possessions. That's exactly what Florida State has done so far in this game. Only a three-man rush. Travis tucks it under and runs. A yard shy of the first down. Makes it third down and one. True freshman Aiden Hall made the tackle. And going back to that screen pass for a touchdown by Trey Benson, Alex Atkins also told us every explosive play doesn't have to be thrown deep down the field. They've found ways in this game to have big catch and runs and create those explosives without Jordan Travis having to throw the ball 40 yards. Swing pass. Jane oh. Bell gets walloped, but he's got the first down. And a gain of five. Oh my 
God, listen to this hit. Holy cow. Nick Anderson just baptized Jaheim Bell right there on that hit. Good for him. He got the first and he probably didn't feel it. Travis floats one down the seam for Bell. Drops it in. Eight different receivers have now hooked up with Jordan Travis Bell. The latest on the last two. And, and they're in the red zone. And Bob, guess who that was on? The man that just lit him up and baptized him. He said, you're going to hit me like that? Okay. I'm going to get this mismatch in the slot. And I'm going to make this big play catch on you. Way to get him back, Jaheim Bell. Nick Anderson originally a walk-on at Wake Forest back in 2020. He can lower the boom, but that time Bell won the battle. One-on-one. -on -one. One-handed catch, Keon Coleman. Another touchdown. Unfair. Holy cow. I mean, Keon Coleman making him that new money today for sure. Been matched up one on one all day in man coverage with Kalen Carson, and he's gotten the better of him so far. Second of the day, ninth of the season through the air for Keon Coleman, leads the ACC. Watch him attack the DB's leverage and then make the play. All you need is one hand sometimes, and look at Jordan Travis, just smooth, calm in the pocket, gives Coleman a ball that he can catch. And if you're Kalen Carson, the only thing I would say, man, is you got to get your eyes back to the ball. You're in great coverage, but Keon Coleman, that's why he plays wide out. He knows how to track a football. He was an incredible basketball player in high school as well. Averaged 26 a game as a junior. Wanted to be a two-sport two athlete, and only grew up about 50 miles away from Baton Rouge and wondered why LSU didn't offer him. Right. He goes to Michigan State, potentially as a two-sport athlete, concentrates on football, but he was such a good basketball player. Randy Livingston was his AAU coach, and Randy Livingston said that Tom Izzo told him, if Keon Coleman had been a basketball player for us a couple of years ago, we would have gone to the Final Four. <laughs> so that's how good of a hoop player he is, and he is... As you said, going to be playing on Sundays in the not-too-distant future. Yes, he will. And that, that catch, honestly, was more like a layup when you talk about what it looked like. But Keon Coleman has shown us that he can he can go up and make some of these amazing catches. Oh, man, I can't wait to show you guys this one right here. Oh, with the <laughs> one-hand snaggeroni against Syracuse. Just snatched that bad boy. And then this one right here against Duke. Hey, ref, get off the mic, man. You're messing up our highlight, okay? He goes down and makes the easy play there. And then right here, you it learns from his mistake earlier of pushing off of Carson and just, huh, no, I'm just going to make a nice adjustment, come over here and make a one-handed snag. He has highlight real-type plays, but he is so much more substance than just the highlights. He's a great route runner, and on that touchdown, he set up Carson perfectly by closing the distance on that inside stem. That was football gold. Well, he took it personally when LSU did not offer him a scholarship. So in the opener this year against the Bayou Bengals, mm. I think he enjoyed all three of the touchdowns he scored. You think so? You think he enjoyed them? <laughs> hey, football players don't don't forget. Everybody in life, they know when they've been slighted. And he made up for it right there against LSU, and he's having a great year. Demon Deacons committed that penalty on the kickoff return. So they start inside their own 10-yard line in a deflected ball at the line so it will be second down to 10 down to Chris for Coleman there was never a decision to give up basketball he just was banged up during one season and said I you know I'm not gonna be able to continue said I want to do whatever sport is gonna set me up to best take care of my family looks like football was the right decision I did ask him if he missed it he said not really I mean got a hoop outside my apartment if I wanted to I'd go play I don't think that's a good idea during the football season <laughs> don't turn an ankle no don't turn an ankle for sure <laughs> Justice Ellison Brought down at the line of scrimmage by Shaheen Brown. I will say this, though, Bob. If he was going to help them go to the Final Four, 
I don't know if he made the right decision because those basketball players are making a boatload <laughs> of cash. And if he's that good, maybe he should change uh, those those cleats in for some basketball shoes. But he's certainly going to be playing in the NFL. So I'm happy for him if he's happy. Well, 31 seven Florida State has the lead and they are looking for more as they call a timeout here with just over a minute to go before halftime. And after third down and 10 if they can hold they could get great field position once again as we're just beginning a triple header of college football action here on ABC and Mitch Griffiths he only has one completion on the day two yards of total offense and Jordan Travis approaching 300 yards of total offense here in the first half. Yeah Bob I'm, I'm dressed up as Harry Potter today and they need to send Mitch Griffiths over to Gryffindor learn some wizardry or something because they haven't been able to get anything rolling and you talk about Florida State taking that timeout. You know why they're doing that because this is a get your bike back game for them. They've lost the last three times that they've played against Wake Forest and they're trying to send a message not just to Wake but the rest of the country that they're one of the best in the country. Griffiths down he goes again. Inside the seven yard line sacked for the fifth time Kalen Deloach brought him down. So Florida State will spend their final time out. And with 58 seconds to go before halftime again they could get great field position. Bob Oshusen here with Harry. <laughs> We had Taylor Swift down on the field before the game. We did. You're, you're pulling this off, by the way. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think, I it think it's the wig. It's, it's strong. The, it's the wig. Uh, all right. So, I mean, what what sorcery right. can Wake Forest use to try and get back in this game? You know, I don't ever call for quarterbacks to be taken out of the game. But with what we've seen, it seems like they need to move on to Santuno Marucci because he's going to give them somewhat of a spark. I've seen receivers on the field putting their hands up. You know, the, the fans are the ones that were here aren't here anymore. And I, I think that he will simplify things for them on offense but also give everybody a feeling like they have a chance to put some points on the board. Coleman on the punt return to the 37 yard line of Wake Forest. The problem of course with Santino Marucci is he is operating with such a limited playbook. That's Correct. what Dave Clawson told us yesterday that it's probably about a third of their offense that he can run and last week against Pitt he may not have even used that much of the playbook so it, they're really handcuffed in that way of course on the other side of the field they're not handcuffed at all as now with every single record it seems offensively being ticked off one at a time by Jordan Travis oh, who's yeah. now tied for third all time in Florida State passing touchdowns. Yeah Jordan Travis like we said he's been nothing short of amazing for this program he stuck it out through the tough times and now is coming to his own and Bob I don't know maybe Chris Rinky was just as old as you were by the time he was done playing <laughs> at Florida State. <laughs> Travis still on the attack looking downfield down the sideline incomplete. Jakai Douglas tried to work his way back to the football and lost his footing as he was bottled up by Evan Slocum. 43 seconds to go in the half. And Jordan Travis he is everywhere in the Florida State record book. Yeah. And, and thinking about how he got off to a bumpy start at one point was thinking about giving up football because yeah. he and Mackenzie Milton went back and forth as to which one was going to be the starter a few years ago. His, his Florida State career did not get off to a smooth start. And he'll run here. And hey. after sliding hit from behind the Florida State fans hoping for a penalty as Kevin Pointer right on the edge of the quarterback sliding and whether or not you can make contact. Uh, I don't know about that Bob. Listen Kevin Pointer is a very good player a great player for Wake Forest but that should have been a flag. Travis had already slid. Blitz coming looking once again for Keon Coleman. He's hoping for a flag and there it is. Kalen Carson will get yeah, help. So you're going to see right here he already slides and then he gets hit. That's a that's a penalty. I don't know what the ref is looking at right there. But then right here when you talk about holding on the defense listen man sometimes if you can't cover them you do got to hold them and and that right there was a flag and it was not a makeup call there should have been two penalties back to back pass interference defense number one the penalty is an automatic first down at the spot of the foul. 
So Florida State with possibly one maybe two opportunities to take a crack at the end zone here with 11 seconds to go before halftime. At the very least they are in comfortable field goal range. Travis over the middle almost intercepted. Wow. Tried to squeeze one into a tight window and Nick Anderson jumped the route and nearly picked it off and it will be a field goal try. Yeah he tried to squeeze in there to Ja'Kai Douglas. Nick Anderson said I might not be able to play great man coverage but I can't play zone. Reads the quarterback's eyes gets in there and breaks it up and that's now two two Bob interceptions that Wake Forest could have gotten that seem to be drops. I always say DBs play DB for a reason but in a game like this going up against the number four team in the country you, you got to make that catch. Again Ryan Fitzgerald perfect so far this season. Play clock is winding down to three two and one. And flags everywhere as it appeared Wake Forest had too many players on the field. But very late to substitute was Florida State which would mean Wake would have an opportunity to substitute and I think that's the argument from Dave Clawson. Not sure it changes the outcome much one way or the other here as it might just be a field goal left on the board for the Knowles. Illegal substitution, defense, the penalty is declined, the field goal is good. Please set the game clock to two seconds. So they will put two seconds back up on the clock, and Florida State will have to kick it off. But a 34 yard field goal goes through for Ryan Fitzgerald. He's now 10 for 10 on the season. And it's up to a 34 7 Florida State lead. The next stop on the F1 schedule is the Mexico City Grand Prix. Tomorrow afternoon, 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific on ABC. Our pre race coverage begins at 2 30 Eastern with additional coverage on ESPN Plus and ESPN Deportes in English and in Spanish at 3 Eastern. And the argument continues. Now, Dave Clawson has a case. The rule is once a substitution is made by the offensive team, the defensive team is given a reasonable amount of time to substitute. Well, if you substitute with about 12 on the play clock, <laughs> Now you're putting the defense into a spot where they have to sprint guys back on and off the field and ultimately it would have changed the position that Ryan Fitzgerald kicked the field goal from by no more than five yards. And you bring that but up. That's a frustrated head coach there with the score being what it is. No 100 percent and you, you bring that up and Dave Boss and and his staff I call them master schemers like they know that they might not have the same talent as the teams that they're playing against but they know how to scheme against them and if you sub late then they should have the opportunity to make substitutions as well but he didn't win that argument with the ref. So a touchback with two seconds to go in the half and Florida State on top 34 to 7. Three hundred and fifty one yards of total offense for Florida State in the first half only seventy seven yards of offense for Wake Forest even with a limited offense at the disposal of Santino Marucci will maybe be keeping our eyes out for him in the second half because he did provide a late game spark last week against Pitt with that come from behind win. But the knee taken by Griffiths and an historic first half for Jordan Travis. As Wake Forest will begin the third quarter with the football. You have to go all the way back to Christian Ponder against North Carolina in 2009 the last time a Florida State player had 300 yards of total offense in a half and it's 34 7 at the break the Knowles on top coming up after the break the Capital One halftime report with Kevin Nagandi and Booger McFarland after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. 
Welcome back to ESPN College Football presented by Head and Shoulders. You're watching the ACC on ESPN. All Florida State dominant performance in the first half here at Wake Forest. The Knowles with a 34-7 lead set for the start of the second half. Bob Wachusen here with RG3. Chris Budden is with us as well. It's been a magical season it so far been. for Florida State. You feeling me? I feel you on that, Bob. <laughs> How about that first half as well? They could do no wrong. Yeah, they could do no wrong, and they righted all their wrongs from the Duke game. They came out, they started fast. We said they needed to put this Wake Forest team away, and they did that certainly. Jordan Travis has been sensational all game, and I don't know why there aren't any pundits out there that are putting him in the top ten of quarterbacks to be drafted this upcoming year. He makes the plays. He's a good football player, and I just – have been really impressed with the way Florida State has gone about approaching this sleepy Winston-Salem game. They were awake early and often. A couple of touchdowns in the first half for Keon Coleman. An 80-yard screen and run as well for Trey Benson. And we'll see if there will be a quarterback change potentially in the second half for Wake Forest. But let's take a look at Three's Keys and how things have gone so far. Yeah, you know, we create these keys to give you something to look at. And when you look at this game, Jordan Travis, 306 total yards. I mean, what more can you ask for the guy responsible for four touchdowns? Then you got Keon Coleman. We talked about that new money. He has certainly made money today. Five catches, 60 yards, and he's got the two touchdowns lined up against Kalen Carson, one of the best DBs in the country. And then it's Mitch Griffiths, one for eight. The key here was Mitch, please, we need you to play well. He has not done that, but they're sticking with him here in the second half. Damon Claiborne maintains his balance and picks up a first down to begin the second half as we check in with Chris. Well, Bob, they may not keep with Griffiths throughout the rest of this second half. I asked Dave Clawson what they needed out of the offense, and he was brutally honest. He said, we just had to be able to focus on first down. He said, we'll see how these first few possessions go, but we will probably see Santiago Marucci. And Marucci was warming up on the sideline to start the second half. A little hookup here, though, with Jamal Banks. And that is another first down for Wake Forest. Shaheen Brown made the stop on the second completion and a flag down as well. Personal foul. Force call the tackle. Defense number 38. That 15-yard penalty is added to the end of the play. Automatic first down. So Brown commits the horse collar personal foul. And it's a good start to the third quarter for Wake Forest. Yeah, he's trying to go and make this tackle. And he pulls him. Ooh, pulls him back. We've seen a lot of injuries happen from those types of tackles. Got to be careful where your hands go, especially on a football field. Don't want to grab that back collar and pull the guy back like that. And it doesn't even need to necessarily be in the collar. If you grab from the nameplate as well, it's the same foul as Claiborne dives forward. So on that replay, didn't even look like Brown got his fingers inside the back of the jersey collar, but it's that action of grabbing the nameplate and dangerously bringing a player to the ground that also is ruled a personal foul. Slow mesh, a bullet to the outside, and the catch is made. Again, it's Banks, and he's right at the first down line to gain. It's been hard to score against this Florida State team in the second half. They have not allowed a second half point since their September 23rd win over Clemson, and they outscored Duke last week 21 to nothing in the second half. Griffiths on the move. Runs to the sideline. And gets bumped out of bounds right about at the line of scrimmage by Tatum Bethune. And Bob, you bring up the fact of just how great Florida State's defense has been in the second half. It's not just that. In the month of October, they're only giving up 8.66 points per game. So it's it's quite amazing what Adam Fuller, their defensive coordinator, has been able to pull off playing so many guys on this defense. Playborn again. Patrick Payton limped off the field after that last play and he looks hobbled on the Florida State sideline as we check in with Chris. Some of that second half uh, stud defense is part of their senior leadership because after halftime in the locker room last week Fabian Lovett went up to his defense and said they are not scoring a single point on us in the second half and the Blue Devils didn't. 
Inside the 10 yard line is Banks with a first down, a third down conversion. Now that's three different completions that we've seen to Jamal Banks. And the only question I have is, what took you so long, right? He's worked against a couple different DBs. He's running nice stop routes, kitty routes on the outside, and Griffiths is, is completing them to them. Why did it take them to be down 34-7 to start doing that? Claiborne gets to the six-yard line before he's turned back. In October, Florida State, in their three ACC games, have only allowed an average of 13.3 points per game. There you go. So their defense has been dominant. And as we said, they have pitched second half shutouts going all the way back to the Clemson win on September 23rd. But threatening here, Wake Forest. Second and goal. Another run with Claiborne. Not much there. It'll be third down and goal at the six. Kalen Deloach made the tackle. So once again here, third and goal, you know you got two downs. I wouldn't be surprised if I saw a run, but I'd like to see them once again attack this matchup down here to the bottom of the screen. Griffiths to throw, backpedaling, and on the move again. Squeezes one in to Banks, but it's incomplete. Now it'll be fourth and goal at the six. And here comes the field goal group. Uh-oh, Bob. You got anything to say about this field goal here? This is a sign that you're just playing out the second half. Because if you actually think you'd have any chance to mount a comeback, of course, you'd be going for it here. But they are going to just take some points to start off the third quarter. It is, seems like a moral victory second half for Wake Forest with this decision. Well, I know that they've got to be at least pleased with the way that Mitch Griffiths has come out after halftime and was distributing the football. But I agree with you. They should have gone for it here. Matthew Dennis puts it through, and it's now 34 to 10. Florida State on top. The first second half points of the month surrendered by the FSU defense. Who is it? The Florida State defense surrenders their first points in the month of October in the second half with three on the board for Wake Forest, but there's defensive coordinator Adam Fuller, and they have put together some masterpieces in this month, especially against Duke last week when they came from behind, got the big kickoff return from Deuce Span in the first half and outscored the Blue Devils 21-0 in the second half to win going away in front of a sold-out crowd. Here is Span now to about the 32-yard line with a flag down. During the return, holding, receiving team number 47, 10-yard penalty, first down, Florida State. And before the game, we had Adam Fuller wired for sound. Let's go, baby. Great focus. Great focus. Great focus. Let's go. Up front, win that line of scrimmage. Big men move stuff. Big men move stuff. It's been a long road, I promise you that. Yeah. It's fun to watch, though, man. I'm playing great defense. I appreciate you saying that. That means a lot. You know, you grow up in this profession, and so you feel like you're so not behind, but like, wow, there's such a big ocean out there. And all of a sudden, like last week, we play against Elko. Now we play against Dave and you. Lambert's here. He came after me at Marshall. It, it is good to see really good people be super consistent. In 2005, Mike Elko is at Duke now. And Dave and Wayne were all just working, trying to stop the triple option in Wofford game. Sack him as a group. Sack him as a group. Good brother. Dial in. Let's go get it. Let's go get it. Go attack it, man. Go attack it. Be your best today. Be your best today. Opportunity. Go take advantage. I know you will. RG3, you know that it's amazing how many times these coaching staffs have crossed over in their career paths as well. Yeah, it is, and it's a brotherhood between those coaches, and we'll talk about just how Coach Fuller makes a fuller impact right after this play. Oh. 
Jet sweep going nowhere. Jaheim Bell, a little flip forward. And he was met by Jasheen Davis in the backfield. Oh, yeah. We haven't said Jasheen Davis's name that much today, but he is a phenomenal football player. You see him right there on the right side of your screen. Look at him just fire through the line of scrimmage and let it know. Listen, we're not giving up yet. We're going to keep playing this game. You know, I talked about Coach Fuller, and, and I asked him who his hero is, and he said his hero was his wife, Hope Fuller. You know, they've got their kids, Jack and Aiden, but he said she's the most unselfish person he's ever met in his entire life, and it allows him to pour all of himself into this football team. Travis, long throw to the sideline, incomplete. So it will be a punt coming for Florida State. And, and you know, when I, I asked Coach Fuller a little bit about, like, yo, how'd you meet uh, your wife? He said he met her in 1999 in Spanish class in Staten Island. I'll leave the rest of that story off the air. But it was a <laughs> phenomenal story. I'm happy for him. And as you talked about, just the crossover with Coach Dave Kloss in there, Bob. I even talked about Mike Elko at Duke last week and how all of these coaches have crossed paths as they've ascended up the ranks to become coordinators and head coaches. And a wobbly kick. Mastromano got him away. Morin into plus territory on the return. Looks like another flag is thrown as well. Oh, they picked that flag up. So with nine and a half minutes to go in the third quarter, and Florida State on top 34 to 10. Good field position for Wake Forest when we come back. ABC College Football, presented by Head & Shoulders, is brought to you by Ram Trucks, America's best light-duty pickup for new vehicle quality. Those the jerseys of Sonia Henderson and Kiva jackson Breland honored this week at Wake Forest University as their next Trailblazer Award nominees and honored at the end of the first quarter as well today. The first black scholarship female athletes at Wake Forest played on the women's basketball team back during the 1980s. It is the Robert Grant and Kenneth Butch Henry Trailblazer Award created by Wake Forest in 2021. Those two, the first black football players at Wake Forest University, so it recognizes their significance and the role that Wake Forest has played in integrating Division I sports in the South as Justice Ellison has nowhere to go at the line of scrimmage and a very late flag comes out. Yeah, before he gets that flag, I just want to say we appreciate your sisters groundbreaking, paving the way for all of us to be able to enjoy sports the way that we do After today. the play, personal foul, unnecessary roughness, defense number 10, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. So Florida State making some uncharacteristic mistakes here in the third quarter as they allowed at least a field goal drive to begin in the third for Wake Forest. And now they give up field position and commit a 15-yard penalty. Yeah, you know, when we talked to Coach Norvell, he said one thing to me that really stuck out. And he said, don't get distracted. Right, coming into this game, they, they had three home games, sellout crowds. Now they're going on the road. They got to bring their own energy to this atmosphere. Well, here in the second half, you don't want to fall asleep and let a team like Wake kind of creep back into it. I know they're down big, but still come out and execute at a high level. Justice Ellison, again, not much there. And Chris Button, Tatum Bethune also has a trailblazer and a groundbreaker in his family tree. Yes, his great, great aunt, Mary McLeod Bethune, started a college for young black girls. Her first students, five little girls and her five-year-old son, Albert Jr. In less than two years, that school grew to 250 students. It would later join with the Cookman Institute and become Bethune-Cookman College, which we know it as now. She went on to become a presidential advisor and one of the earliest black female activists that have helped lay the foundation for the modern, modern civil rights movement. She lived an amazing life. The first member of her family not born into slavery and eventually went on to become a presidential advisor as Chris said to FDR yes and became a pioneer in not just women's education but specifically black women's education just an amazing story and throw low to the outside and guys I just have to say your willingness to, to tell the truth and, and share those stories, Bob and Chris, means the world to me. And I know it means the world to a lot of people that are listening, because it's important that we tell these stories so that people understand 
the impact that some of these players have had in their generations before them to pave the way for us to live the life that we do. Wake Forest going for it on fourth and six and fail. Intended for Cameron Height, but again, low and outside from Mitch Griffiths. So starting in plus territory, the Demon Deacons, but they turn it over on downs. So it goes back to FSU. Yeah, you're going to see Mitch Griffiths is going to catch the ball. And right here, just little happy feet in the pocket. Just pick that ball up. Give your receiver an opportunity to make the play, especially on fourth down. But Bob, your point about the last drive they had kicking the field goal, they're probably telling themselves, see, that's why we kicked the field goal last time, because we couldn't get it on fourth down. I still want to see them continue to try to get the football to Jamal Banks, but when they do, they got to make catchable balls be the throw. Trey Benson. Crab crawls out to about the 29-yard line, picks up seven. And you would anticipate that being up 24, Florida State's going to give a heavy dosage of running the football. And they've got about four backs that they really trust to get it done. Play action. Travis up the seam in stride, breaking free Ja'Kai Douglas. Ankle tackle, saved the touchdown as he stumbles after Evan Slocum tripped him up to the 38-yard line of Wake. And just like that, they run a play-action pass right over the top. Jordan Travis finds Ja'Kai Douglas. And Jasheen Davis called for roughing the passer on that push of Jordan Travis that adds 15 more on the end of the play. So 48 yards in all. Yeah, he was probably upset because he was expecting a run too. Wasn't expecting them to go back and keep going for the juggler with the play action pass over the top. Good to see Ja'Kai Douglas out in the open field. I know they've had high hopes for him to get him back out there fully healthy and making plays is a good sign. One on one, catch made. Keon Coleman to the 20-yard line with Kalen Carson hanging on for dear life around his ankle, limiting him to a three-yard gain. And, like, when we showed the, the stats before, it's not like Keon Coleman is, like, 10 catches for 250 yards. Kalen Carson has done a nice job limiting his yardage. It's been those big plays of a touchdown here or there. So you say he's holding on for dear life because he certainly was. He's trying to make sure that he continues to attack this matchup for the rest of the game. Quick toss to Benson. Out of bounds at the 17. Quincy Bryant bumped him out. They'll actually mark him out at the 18-yard line, so five yards shy of a first down. Jordan Travis piles up incredible offensive numbers. First FSU player with 300 yards of total offense and four touchdowns responsible for in a half in the last 20 seasons. He now has 15 consecutive games with multiple touchdowns accounted for. It's a new FSU record as well. And a swing pass here caught by Benson. Fights for extra yardage. He might have a first down. Wow. Jacob Roberts got there first. Nick Anderson tried to rip the ball out. Let's see where they mark it. <laughs> and the most impressive thing is watch how he fights to get up. Stays up, and then they're trying to take the ball away from him. And he's like, okay, yeah, go ahead, carry me to a first down. I I I'd love that. Or at least close to it. And, and they do now without is. measurement say first down. Awarded to Trey Benson. They might have gave him the first down just on the extra effort. <laughs> A cold star. <laughs> Another touch for Benson. Ooh. To the 11-yard line. Picks up a couple. Again, Jacob Roberts, two-time FCS All-American at North Carolina A&T before coming over to Wake Forest. Made the stop. And you talk about Jacob Roberts. They say this man's been a tackling machine. Feel like he's really just vibed well with the team. He's only been there for a little bit, but they think he's been there for four years. He's bought into the culture and been a big part of their defense. Of course, today, the showing hasn't been the best for them as a whole, but he has had a really good year. Uh -oh. 
Travis has a one-on-one. -on -one. Incomplete. Darion Williamson on the dive. Couldn't haul it in. Sean Jones was there. Right here, you're going to see the one-on-one. -on -one. He attacks it and then widens. Great route. Good throw. Ball hits your hands like that. you got to make that catch. I would say that Darion Williamson, based off what I've seen on tape, makes that catch nine times out of ten. That just so happened to be the one time. FSU can pick up a first down inside the three yard line. Third down and eight. Three man rush. Back shoulder at the pylon, unable to hold it in, was Keon Coleman. So it looks like Ryan Fitzgerald will come out and try and tack on three more. So they went one on one up to the top of the previous play, then they go one on one down here. And what did Kalen Carson do this time that he didn't on the touchdown? In the first half, he got his eyes back to the quarterback. That's why anyone at home that's saying, oh, it's pass interference, he was holding him. The ref sees the eyes go back, and a lot of times they tuck that flag deep, deep, deep into their pocket. Nice coverage there by Kalen Carson. 29 yards for Fitzgerald. Already two for two today and 10 for 10 on the season. Hits the upright, and there's his first miss. Wow, Bob. At some point, there had to be an announcer jinx somewhere. You, you jinxed him. You jinxed and him. I became the unlucky guy. Sorry, Ron. You, you did first it. first miss of any kick this year. You did it earlier in the game, and he made it. But this time, the doink got him. <laughs> All right, Kevin, thanks very much. Tate Carney starts this drive with a dive ahead. And as much as I love working with RG3, the fact that right now BC is beating UConn and I'm not standing next to Dan Orlovsky, <laughs> there is some serious pain there. But next up, we've got BYU in Austin to take on Texas Duke Louisville this afternoon as well. And then, of course, Coach Prime with a flag down later on tonight at the Rose Bowl. Flags everywhere on that run on second down and four. Personal foul, horse collar tackle, defense number seven, 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. So they get Jari and Jones for a horse collar tackle. As you're going to see here, it's not, That's not Jari, Jari and Jones, Jones no. but holy schmoly. That's Byron Turner. How about that? Look at how hard he throws Buddy into the ground. Hit him with a WWE wrestling move there. But... It's a penalty. <laughs> you definitely don't want to do that. Got to keep the fingers out of the back of that jersey. Griffiths, slant, Jamal Banks to midfield for the first down. Oh, check that nine. They mark him down one yard shy as Bernardo Green made the tackle. And Bob, I said this out of the halftime. They, they were getting the ball out faster, throwing the ball to Jamal Banks. And I feel like they just had a little bit of effort in them in the second half, and they're just letting Mitch kind of play a little bit more freely, and they're moving the ball at least better than they did in the first half. Maybe they should take that similar approach at the beginning of the game. Yeah, which is odd if that is any kind of a kind of philosophical change, because basically what Dave Clawson told us yesterday was, we know we have no chance to win this game unless you almost take that approach from the start, right? Yeah. I mean, he said, we score 17, 21 points in this game, that's not enough to beat Florida State. Slow mesh. Griffiths pulls it down. And Florida State pulls him down. After a gain of a couple, there is another tackle made by Byron Turner. And this is what I was talking about earlier in the game. When you run that slow mesh, it, it closes the different, the distance between the quarterback and the offensive line. Watch, Griffiths is going to walk down. He's getting closer and closer and closer. But now Griffiths has to kick back. He has to set back to be able to give himself space to wait on those throws. Well, this time he's able to put one over the middle. And how about the hurdle job done by Tate Carney to pick up a couple extra yards, a gain of 20. Yeah, nice job by Griffiths just giving it to the open guy. And then, whoa, there she goes. 
Up and over the top by Tay Carney. Sometimes those hurdles can go wrong. Luckily for him, he was able to come down and be okay as we got a guy down on the field. He jumped over the top of the Keen Dent. And Bernardo Green is the player shaken up for Florida State. So you see him jump over Akeem Dent. Oh, and then Ronaldo Green is just right there. Gets a little shoulder shimmy from his teammate. And uh, not really sure what's going on, but we will certainly find out here in a second. Certainly on that replay, couldn't pick up what caused an injury to Ronaldo Green. 2.35 to go in the third quarter, and Florida State comfortably in front 34 to 10 it's almost time for the first college football playoff rankings release Halloween on ESPN that's Tuesday we'll have the college football playoff top 25 show presented by Allstate all right as we get ready for the release these were the predictions that we had or at least our own rankings coming into the first release yeah and I want everyone at home to know that this set of rankings right here that is the right one. I just just pay attention to those as Bob and Chris give their breakdowns of why they have their players there, the teams right. there. So just Michigan has been as dominant as any team in college football, but look at the wins yes. that Ohio State and Florida State have had. And who has Michigan beaten to justify them being number one? I guess that would be my question. And they may well be number one, but they're going to have a chance to prove it. And fans, don't forget, you can go to ESPN.com slash Allstate Playoff Predictor and check out your team's chances to make the college football playoff. So you asked who has Michigan beaten, and I, I really don't have an argument against anyone that wants to put Ohio State at number one because of their two top 15 wins. But the way Michigan has looked, regardless of who they're playing, has been the most dominant. Griffiths. Inside the 10, down to the six yard line. A gain of 20. Oh, I love seeing that from Mitch Griffiths. I feel like he's been a little bit tiptoeing in the pocket right here. He doesn't have it. He gets vertical, puts his foot in the ground, and runs like a dog is chasing him. Sometimes, as a quarterback, you have to understand that you don't have to play perfect football, you just have to go out there and be a football player. And right there, Mitch was being a football player. And another injury for Florida State. This time it's Malcolm Ray that is down. So let's check in with Chris Button. Wanted to defend why I have Michigan number one overall because I feel like that there was some shade being thrown down here. Listen, no, I, I understand when you look at the schedule that they haven't really played anyone, but they've been beating opponents by an average of 34.8 points per game. And when you look at how difficult it is week in, week out for 18 to 22 year olds to go on the road and be able to dominate teams. This is a Florida State team that was trailing on the road to Boston College, Georgia, you know, South Carolina, Auburn. Uh, last week, Oklahoma against UCF, the ability to be able to play and dominate the way that they have every single week says a lot to me. That said, the rest of their schedule, the rest of Georgia's schedule, if they continue to win out Florida State, it will all even itself out. Yeah, and Michigan will have a chance to prove it if you are giving them any, throwing any shade at them, as I am, <laughs> for not having beaten anyone. Well, they've got Penn State and Ohio State left. So as Chris said, it will shake itself out as Tate Carney after the injury timeout gets to the two yard line. Hey Bob I'm not gonna lie to you man Chris is preaching down there. OK she was preaching. She's a talk show host. Listen she she, she knows her stuff. She'll be taking your calls on Big 12 <laughs> radio during the week. And and honestly like we don't know who the best team in the country is. Let's just be honest about it. We're all just projecting at this point when it's all said and done who is in undefeated at the end of the year after they played the, the, the thickness of their schedule will be in the college football player. Carney into the end zone. There's the first touchdown allowed in the second half of this month by the Florida State defense. As Wake Forest finds the end zone for the second time today, under a minute to go in the third. Yeah, Tate Cartney comes in, just a simple, easy, downhill power running play. I know you see those triceps when he points to the sky, so you know he's got a little bit of power in him. And they will go for two. Could make this a two possession game if this two point try is successful. Would that make up for them kicking the field goal, Bob? In your mind? Not at all. <laughs> it's okay. Griffiths. 
Goes down again. Thrown down by Braden Fisk. So the two point try nullified. 34 16 with 52 seconds to go on the third. Yeah, Braden Fisk just there on the left side of your screen. Comes in, gets the sack, no celebration. Almost like he just little boyed him. Like, all right, man, y'all trying to mount a comeback. Stop it. So Wake Forest, at least with a third quarter with some production that maybe they can build on as they head to the fourth, but still down three scores with less than a minute to go in this quarter. Yeah, and then we talked about Florida State need to maximize their possessions. In, in these situations, in these types of games, they have to not just score the ball, but take the air out of the ball at this point. Don't allow your defense to continue to get numbers put up on them. Run the football, run the clock down as much as you can, or you know, continue to score in 10 seconds. Whatever it may be for Florida State, they just got to keep the pedal to the metal and don't ease off with the Demon Deacons. Line drive. Span will take a knee. And Kevin Nagandi, how is it possible there's no Dan Orlovsky back in the studio when Boston College is beating UConn? This is tragic. <laughs> we'll make sure to remind him. Meanwhile, Kansas, they came back to play after the lightning delay, and really that, that helped Oklahoma. Well, Kansas may have come back, but their defense didn't. No. So far, it's all sooner. Dylan Gaber up 21-17 after that. How about Keaton Slovis now at BYU? What number of school this is? I have four. Four, yeah. 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 A lot of maturity. We got Cougars and the Longhorns <laughs> coming your way in less than 50 minutes here. Bob, Andre 3000 and Chris, back to you. Hey, <laughs> I like it. Okay, that was a good one. That's a good one. First to 10, Florida State at their own 25 yard line. Still with a three score lead. Trey Benson. It stood up, but boy, the first guy never seems to bring him down. No, and like I said, He's such a big back, 6'1", 223, and you don't really see guys like that be able to really take, just take it to the house. I mean, this a, it's not a comparison, but I, I remember a guy like Adrian Peterson, who was a power back who could also just hit the home run, big runs all the time. Trey Benson is doing that, and I think for him, the 100 yards receiving in the passing game is such an added element to this offense. Again, it's Benson. And he is about a yard and a half to two yards shy of a first down. And that should take us down to the end of the third quarter with the Knowles on top, 34 to 16. We'll be back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Welcome back, Coach Norvell. Despite the injuries to your wideouts, what have you been pleased with with your offense's ability to move the football today? Yeah, we've had some big plays. Uh, you know, obviously uh, Jordan's doing a good job and being able to push the ball down the field. Our receivers are making plays with opportunities. Uh, but obviously we've had, you know, the third quarter wasn't what we wanted. You know, too many penalties. Uh, you know, put us in a tough situation. So we got to respond and go, go finish the game. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Well, they've got a three-score lead to begin the fourth quarter. Third down and short for FSU. As Jordan Travis working on a 314 yard day through the air. A little swing pass here and the pick play works. Jaheen Bell with a first down catch. Yeah, you taught it a pick play and it is. It's a nice little rub, but just trying to get over there and make those blocks happen just as the tight end catches it. I love it. Listen, there's nothing wrong with using the rules to your advantage. And part of what you've seen is them throwing the football. You talked about how he has over 300 yards passing. But the running game hasn't quite been as productive as you would expect. But they're utilizing the short passing game to supplant the running game. So it's all the same at the end of the, at the, end of the day, and it's just yards. Rodney Hill. You know what I think also is a sign of a well-coached team? So often, you'll see teams that can play quickly, only play quickly, correct? Because it's all that they practice. So you talked about it. You have to be true to what you are. But I do think a sign of a well-coached team is a team that is comfortable playing any pace. Yes. When they want to step on it and play NASCAR pace because they have to, they do. But you can see right now, Florida State very comfortable with this lead taking the play clock all the way down and it's still not disrupting their rhythm on offense. 
Travis looks downfield and he'll take off and run. Breaks a tackle and it looks to be good enough for a first down right at the line of the game. Another tackle for Aiden Hall. And you talk about this, Bob, but it's it's the confusion with tempo. People think, oh, you go fast, just go fast, just do this. It's not about just going fast. It's about being able to utilize three different tempos. Green, yellow, and red. Red is slow, yellow is looked to the sideline, and green is just all out fast speed. You're just trying to keep the defense off balance, and Florida State has done a great job of that all year. Lowering his shoulder is Rodney Hill. He's got six yards. Kalen Carson made the tackle. Well, most consecutive games with 30 or more scored in that game. Florida State was up to 14 in a row at halftime. <laughs> and they are tracking down their own ACC record from the 2012 through 2014 run where they had 17 consecutive games where they scored 30 or more. And the guy that's been at the helm leading them that entire time has been Jordan Travis. And today, like I said, he's been sensational, and he's played himself into the Heisman conversation. Back to throw again here. Drops it in. Kyle Morlock all the way down to about the five-yard line before he's brought down. They'll mark him down at the six. You're going to see a nice token fake on the play action. They got him going on a deep cross post across the field. Jordan Travis finds the Wi-Fi connection and airdrops a beauty into Morlock's arms. I dare I say that was a Heisman-like throw. Jordan Travis does not get the love that he deserves. But I can tell you what, from us, he certainly will. Look at that, 22 of 34 for 359 yards and three touchdowns. He's also, I believe, their leading rusher today. He's doing it all. Again with the late substitution by Florida State Forest, I'm out. and Wake Forest trotting some players on as well. The play clock was winding down, so Mike Norvell spends a timeout. Welcome back. This is a Florida State football team with so many high expectations. Possible CFP, Jordan Travis, the possible Heisman finalist. And Mike Norvell could tell that his quarterback has feeling the weight of the world on his shoulders. So after the Syracuse game two weeks ago, he met with his quarterback and said, listen, I understand all the pressure that you're dealing with, but what's the point of it if you're not having fun? So try and figure out a way to balance both of those. And Jordan Travis, so thank you. Like, thank you for recognizing everything that I was feeling, but also reminding me that if we don't do this and I'm not having fun, then there's no point going out here. Well, he's been having fun, that's for sure. And he tries to extend the play here. A shovel pass to nowhere. Jaheim Bell was at least in the area. Was he down? They will say no. So it looks like that shovel pass will save them the sack yardage unless his knee hit the turf. The ruling on the field is an incomplete pass. Second down. So Jordan Travis saved his team about 10 yards. Yeah, you know, you got to be careful in these situations not to try to do too much. But he stays up, makes the, oh! I think his knee might have been down before that ball came out. I want you guys to watch. Watch his knee right here. And knee down. He still has the ball, so that's going to be a sack down at that spot. And the refs will confirm it, hopefully, when we get back. Interesting. When will the Arch Manning era start? We'll find out. Well, that was a sack. Jordan Travis taken down by Jasheen Davis, as you called, RG3. Yes, we talked about it right before the break, said that the rest would confirm it, and you can see his knee is down, the ball is still in his hand. It has to be completely gone for it to be a pass, not a sack. So for Davis's 18th career sack, and the first of the day for Wake Forest. All day to throw for Travis. Oh. And Right into the hands of Portier, but he couldn't hold on. That'll make it third down and goal, but back at the 18-yard line. Now, Kentron Portier was open for so long. You see Travis trying to direct him. He tried to take his eyes away before he had secured the catch. That is the cardinal sin for wide receivers. Keep your eyes on the ball, look it in, then go make the play. Portier right there was trying to pour it on and get some extra yardage before he had completed the catch. 
They'll run it with Trey Benson, and he finds a crease to the end zone for a touchdown. That was most likely a play call just to set up the field goal. And the seas parted, and Trey Benson scores from 18 yards out. His second rushing touchdown of the day. Bob, C's parted is probably the best way to describe that run because the offensive line didn't allow Trey Benson to get touched to almost the four-yard line. And when you give a guy that size, that amount of real estate to continue to go downhill, it's going to be a problem. Watch. No one touches him. No one touches him. No one touches him. There's Nick Anderson right there getting a hand on him at the four-yard line. Trey Benson's like, hey, y'all might want to set up this field goal, fam, but <laughs> I got other ideas. And while the three and Garnet scores, three and black and gold is down. Malik Mustafa injured on the play. So Trey Benson. You're live on Disney Plus. ABC College Football is presented by Head and Shoulders. Make every wash count. Winkler Bakery, established in 1807 by Christian Winkler, run by his family and descendants until 1926. The oldest continually operating bakery in America. And now I'm starving. Oh, I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so Mustafa being looked at over on the sideline. He was able to head off the field on his own, though. Ryan Fitzgerald on for the point after. After Trey Benson's second touchdown of the day. One on the ground, one through the air. And he's got eight total on the season. Tuesday, we'll have the exclusive reveal of the first college football playoff top 25 rankings of the season. Reese and the guys will break them down from top to bottom with coach reactions, as well as a live interview with committee chairman Boo Corrigan of NC State. 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on ESPN in the app. That's Tuesday night, and let's take a look at this week's college football playoff rankings brought to you by Verbo. And again, a lot of teams in the top 10, not only playing today, but playing on the road. Of course, Georgia and Florida at 3.30. That game in Jacksonville, there'll be a lot of Georgia fans there as well. But there are a lot of Florida State fans here at Wake Forest. They have the benefit of some of that help. Oklahoma struggling with Kansas, Penn State and Indiana tied at 24 as well. So a lot of college football left to play today, and strange things can happen at this time of year. Yeah, I was going to say, do you consider that Georgia game to truly be on the road no. because it's in Jacksonville? It's not a pure road game. It's just not at um, Athens. Yeah, yeah. Out to the 23-yard line on the return. Coming up next to 3.30 Eastern on ABC. Our triple header rolls on. Texas will host BYU. And then we will cap the day later on tonight at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Colorado and Coach Prime will take on number 23 UCLA, our Saturday night football game at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. Steve Sarkeesian coming up next against his former team. Of course, played quarterback at BYU in the mid-90s when Robert Griffin III was in diapers when I was out of college. <laughs> Well, now, of course, on the sidelines at Texas. I will, I will say this, Bob. If I was in diapers in 1995, we got a problem. Because <laughs> I was five years old. But, but, but Sark, he looking good right there, you know? I know for me, like when I had those pictures of throwing the football, the tongue was out like Michael Jordan. But <laughs> Sark's done a really nice job there at Texas. They have a roster that is college football playoff worthy. They just have to win out the rest of the season and have some things go their way to potentially make it, and it starts with beating BYU. Santino Marucci is now in at quarterback after the win against Pitt last week. The only Wake player from the state of Florida on their roster. He was recruited as a quarterback, but then they moved him at one point to running back, one point to safety. Well, he went back to quarterback during summer camp, had an opportunity to play as a starter for the first time last week against Pitt and won literally at the buzzer. Yeah, I mean, made a big time throw there uh, to Cameron Height to win the game. And like Coach Dave Clawson said throughout the week, your job as the quarterback is to win the game. He'll remember that moment forever. 
And now they're bringing him in here to get him some more reps to see if they're going to make a change or do something here in the future at the quarterback position. A handoff to Tate Carney. And Carney, a little bit of extra yardage, dives out to the 31. Chris? Well, when, earlier this season, Marucci was going and having lunch with Demont Claiborne, and he said, "Listen, I'm, I'm frustrated. Things haven't worked out the way that I thought that they would when I came to Wake Forest." And Claiborne said, "Just, just pay your dues. Just wait. It'll happen. It'll happen." And so they went up to him after the game-winning touchdown yesterday. They went into the locker room, gave him a huge hug, and he said, "I told you. I told you. If you just bide your time and you wait and you're patient, you believed in yourself, you would have your moment. And look at what it feels like to finally do it and see it come to fruition." Yeah, seeing the scene in that Wake Forest locker room as they pick up a first down here at the end of that game last week. And now Santino Marucci was rallied around. Matt, that's one of those college football moments that those guys will take with them forever. Yeah, they will. And there's nothing better than a winning locker room. And when we talked with Dave Clawson and we talked with Warren Ruggiero, he told us great quarterback play here at Wake Forest really hit a lot of the shortcomings of the rest of their roster. So from what they saw from Mitch Griffiths, through the spring and fall camp, they thought, all right, we're going to be good because Mitch knows the system and he's doing a good job. It just hasn't come to fruition at the quarterback spot. You got to know that that is something that when you have a quarterback like Sam Hartman, who transfers out to Notre Dame, who threw for almost 13,000 yards here, there's going to be a couple steps back at the QB spot. I just don't think they anticipated it being this far down. Yeah, Dave Clawson and Warren Ruggiero did not forget how to coach from last season to this season. Not this Wake Forest offense is the only ACC offense six years in a row to average 30 or more points per game. Last year they led the ACC. Two years ago they averaged 41 points per game. Yeah. But when you lose Sam Hartman, when that, those are tough shoes to fill. They didn't have another one like a Wolford or a Hartman in the pipeline. They'll get one, yeah. but they need to go find a quarterback. And I think what they also talked to us about was that for Mitch Griffiths or Santino Marucci, it doesn't mean that they're not the guy, right? Sam had some struggles here, and he had to overcome those, and maybe that's the same thing that'll happen for Mitch Griffiths or Santino can go out here and take this quarterback job over. And again, the targets downfield locked up by Florida State, allowing a Byron Turner sack. So that will bring the punt group out for Wake Forest. Since the start of 2021, Wake Forest coming into today had thrown 92 touchdown passes. That's fifth best in America, but you lose Hartman, hard to replace, and also they lost Donovan Green. Remember that that's their best wide receiver that went down because of a knee injury on the first day of camp. He was second on the team last year in yards and had six touchdowns. Yeah, and they also as lost well. A.T. Perry to the NFL. Like right. They had a lot of things that that have gone not gone their way and a lot of players that have moved on to other places and they're feeling the ramifications of that. Midway through the fourth quarter, Florida State with a 41 to 16 lead. So when the game is lopsided, you keep yourself occupied. Uh, that looks like a blast. Maybe we should go do that, Bob. Yeah, it's another sack. Well, Kevin, Florida State up by much more than that, and that allows them to put Tate Rodemaker in the game to give him a chance to play at quarterback. So both coaches going to their backup QBs with the score lopsided midway through the fourth. And Rodemaker will hand one to Keziah Holmes. Aiden Hall with another tackle, no gain on first down. Yeah, I anticipate that Tate Rodemaker will be doing a lot of handing off, but last time I said that, Florida State threw a play action pass for a massive gain. So he had seven appearances last season. This year, he's been highly efficient. I mean, I think anybody would take five or six for 133 yards and three touchdowns any day of the week. Good opportunity for him to get a nice six minutes of action here at the end of the game. Play action, seam shot, has the crosser. <laughs> Harry on Williamson across midfield. I can't help but laugh because it's exactly what happened last time. Nice little play action pass, got the play action slant right behind it. 
Darion Williamson makes sure he holds on to that catch and was looking to split it and take it to the house. This Florida State team is continuing to be aggressive with their play calls no matter who's playing quarterback. Always feels good when you're a quarterback and you come in, you know, in relief time and that first pass you throw, you see it completed and it goes for a big game. This time, Keziah Holmes is able to pick up about four. Well, that, of course, wraps the day for Jordan Travis. 359 yards through the air and three touchdowns. Tack on a rushing touchdown as well. And looking at some of the odds, say, out in the desert as to who they think is going to win the Heisman Trophy. Of course, J.J. McCarthy is up there. Michael Penix is certainly high up there as well. Jaden Daniels at LSU. Then there's kind of that second tier and Jordan Travis is rising up, if not leading, that second tier of Heisman candidates. What do you think? Yeah, he's actually playing his best football as the season goes on. Early in the year, you're seeing Caleb Williams and Michael Penix Jr. put up these video game style numbers. But Jordan Travis, now as they get into the thick of this ACC schedule, is going to be playing against really good teams Prior and putting up snap. really good numbers. Delay a game, offense, five-yard penalty. Second down. So Tate Rodemaker got a little too cute with the play clock, took it all the way down and passed zero. So that cost them five. But as we take a look at some of the numbers of notable Heisman candidates, again, entering this week. So Jordan Travis's numbers have only gotten better as of today. Uh, McCarthy, obviously, all of the lopsided wins they've had. And there's no one in America that throws a prettier football than Michael Penix Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up the middle goes Hill, and he stood up after a gain of three yards. But if you're just looking for pure eye candy, you want to watch Michael Penix Jr. throw the ball. Yeah, I mean, I keep saying it, but it's the truth. He's a lefty, but he throws it just right. But here is the numbers that are the real impact on why Jordan Travis has not been mentioned with some of those other guys. He's not putting up the video game style numbers in the passing game week in and week out, which is why today's game has been a great After Heisman play, statement for him. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Offense number 54, his first of the game. 15-yard penalty. The down counts. It's third down. So an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty called against Florida State early after the play. Nine penalties now for 115 yards for FSU. And still there comfortably out in front with four and a half minutes to go. And when I talk about those video game style numbers, part of that is just Florida State and the guys around him, you know, subscribing to a little bit of that HBO. Help a brother out, okay? You saw Trey Benson today take a screen 80 yards to the house. That adds to those numbers for Jordan Travis. And the people who are voting, they don't know that that was a screen pass. That might as well have been an 80-yard throw with him throwing it 60 yards down the field. Some of that stuff does matter, even though we don't love to admit it. Rodemaker. A third down scramble. Remember asking Bill Parcells one time, define great quarterback play. He said, does your quarterback get you in the end zone? And does your team win the game? Well, he does this on a weekly basis. Yes, he does. You see the touchdown run. Then here, he's making a big throw down the field to Jaheim Bell. Another one here to Keon Coleman. That's a simple, easy throw that they take to him. But he knows how to find the end zone. He always seems to throw the appropriate ball when he's making these passes. And I don't think that that's talked about enough. You want to talk about accuracy? It's not always about having the strongest arm. Sometimes it's about putting the ball exactly where it's supposed to be at. And Jordan Travis is usually right. Also somewhat surprising that he isn't at least, and I'm not saying he should be considered a top five pick in the NFL draft, but shouldn't he be higher up and maybe more well thought of in NFL circles where some of the draft picks seem to have him going? Yeah, I think if you look at the draft pundits, and I got a lot of respect for those guys, they work very hard at their jobs. But if you don't have Jordan Travis in your top 10 quarterbacks, everybody at home, throw that list away. It doesn't make any sense. If Brock Purdy is the last pick in the draft, and he's been playing the way that he has in the NFL for the San Francisco 49ers. Doesn't matter who is around him, he's making elite level decisions. He reminds me of a guy like Jordan Travis, and Jordan Travis is more dynamic than Brock Purdy was at Iowa State. He should certainly be on people's lists, and I think he will be by the time the draft comes around. And sometimes you live this. 
the best thing that can happen to a quarterback is to be drafted later by a really good team yes. with a great structure around them, a team that's already winning. So if you get a chance to play, look at the support system rather than what oftentimes happens with young, inexperienced quarterbacks. You just get hand keys to the car of a bad team, and you're asked to be the savior at 21 years old. I mean, that could be really hard. Yeah, it can. And, and to your point, look at what was going on at Florida State a few years ago when it didn't start out great for Jordan Travis and the team around him wasn't as good as they are today. Now you allow him to go through some of those growing pains. You trust him. You stick with him. The team around him is better. He's playing better because he knows it all. That could be a scenario for him going into the NFL that could, you know, play to his benefit. David Egby up the middle for a couple of yards. So it will be third down for Wake Forest at their own 13 yard line. Well, you were handed the keys to a difficult car to drive and you went out and became the rookie of the year. So <laughs> it, it can be done. But how often do we take quarterbacks that didn't even play two full seasons of college football? and ask them to go save an NFL franchise when they're not even 23, 24 years old yet. Yeah, it happens all the time, and I try to tell people this. Every guy's NFL journey is a little bit different, but one thing is a fact. There aren't very many coaches or front offices in the NFL that know how to grow and develop and support their quarterback. You want to go to teams that do know how to do that, one who's been really shining over the past you know, still feels like a decade has been Patrick Mahomes with Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs. But for guys like Jordan Travis, it could be beneficial to go to a really good team and sit and wait for your opportunity as opposed to going to a team that is drafting high in the draft because they're that bad of a football squad. So the clock winds all the way down and Wake Forest calls a timeout as they are just trying to end the game here with a minute 18 to go. Let's check in with Kevin. Bob, let's go back to Lawrence here. No Jalen Daniels. You got Jason Bean. Kansas down by one book, and let's get the keeper here from the quarterback. Yeah, the defense is being crashed down, and who knew Bean has speed like that? 38 yards of the house, no two-point conversion. Right now, it's 26-21. Oklahoma just scored moments ago. They're up 27-26. So keep that in mind. We will keep an eye on this game and reminding you, we're also going to be in the Big 12. That is Xavier Worthy. Got to do new quarterback in Malik Murphy today. Big play waiting to happen. When you get a new quarterback, look for some goal routes down the field to Worthy and A.D. Mitchell. Texas BYU less than eight minutes away. Back to you guys. We are just starting the college football day here on ABC, ESPN as well. Ivan Mora will kick it away, and no one back deep to receive for Florida State. So down to the last minute and 10 seconds. The Knowles can come out and simply take a knee and put this one in the books. And you've seen our pumpkins carved all throughout the game. I want to give some love to Kyan Patel of Richmond, Virginia, Emerson Foley from St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Diane plans to study business and art. Emerson exploring engineering and art. And they are our pumpkin carvers. The art department at Wake celebrates these interdisciplinary connections. And we empower students through creativity and community. From all of us at ESPN, thank you to Kyan and Emerson. I love that music. That music in the background is spooky. Rodemaker gets the clock started, and for Florida State, they will stay perfect. They will break their three-game losing streak head-to-head -head against Wake Forest. Jordan Travis will continue to be mentioned, at least in the Heisman conversation, and they are a heavy favorite in their last four games. Now, what is sneaky, of course, about those last four games is two of them are rivalry games. Yep. One, of course, a road rivalry game. Weird things happen in rivalry yeah. games. But it's hard to envision this Florida State team beating themselves yeah, at I, this point. That they, they have been so mistake-free for the most part. They've been focused on the climb, and they call it commitment. Were they committed today? Yes. Did they do the little things? Yes, they did. Were they intense? Yeah, they had a few penalties, but it was because of that intensity. They showed mental toughness, and they are a brotherhood. 
The great Deion Sanders said, if your dream isn't bigger than you, then your dream isn't big enough. And Florida State has their eyes on the college football playoff, and they're doing what they have to to get there. Once again, our final score, Florida State 41. And Wake Forest, 16. For Robert Griffin III and Chris Budden, I'm Bob Wachusen. Thanks so much for watching. So long from Winston-Salem. Time to head back to the studio alongside Booker McFarland. Here's Kevin Augusta. Bob, thank you so 